Hello, everybody. How is everybody doing tonight? Uh, welcome. Welcome to Nights of Last Call. My name is Derek Melinda. I'm going to take my seat down a little bit here. Oh, there we go. Um, welcome. Hello, everyone. We got Ryan Dale. We've got Frosty in the chat, both YouTube champion, uh, YouTube uh, adventurers, I should say, supporters of the channel. We also got Ben, Boothby, Satyr, Frost, everybody. Frost Jack's here. So we got the we got a good little representation here. Um, welcome. So tonight we're doing something a little different. Um, yes, this week, uh, yeah, I'm going to be going on vacation and be going out to back back out to Las Vegas. <laughs> ben, it tipped one hundred dollars. First tip for the inaugural first look. Next time, try Charbos if you want a serious challenge. Lol, I hope you keep doing these. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. <laughs> See, and like that, this stream was more successful than the 4E stream. Boom. That's how you get it done. Thank you, Ben. Um, uh, you know, uh, that is extremely gracious of you. Thank you, sir. Yes. If, uh, baller as usual. Um, and, and to be, uh, you know, completely uh, fair, um, you know, this is something that I, I have talked with Ben about for a while um, and, and some of the other patrons um, that have been around for a long time. Uh, you know, a big part of Knights of the Last Call is exploring new games and i think all of you who have been uh you know, fans of this channel or members of our patreon know that you know people like myself people like ben um even people like pawn no longer are really really interested in bringing new games to people's attention and i think that you know just focusing on the one most popular game is a mistake and so tonight this is uh, what we're calling first look. Uh, other YouTubers have done this. Uh, Adam Cobell, who uh, you know obviously wrote uh, Dungeon World, was kind of most famous for doing this. And the idea here is I am going to take an RPG that is somewhat newish. Um, and I bought the PDF. I have not looked through the PDF. It's open up here on first page. I know a little bit about the game from what people have said, but I don't know anything really about the mechanics or its content. And it's really just about us kind of exploring it together and getting some of my first impressions. What do I think of the mechanics? And how do I think that those mechanics are serving the needs of what the game seems to be about? We'll definitely be talking about uh, Jared Sorensen's three questions. Uh, you know, his big three questions, which is, what is this game about? And how does it do it? And if you do it, how does it reward you? And we'll certainly be keeping those things in mind as we go through, you know, these these this process. So uh, I want to say thanks again to Ben for supporting this idea, um, not just with the tip, which was extremely generous, uh, but just sort of being a, a believer and a fan and certainly one of the biggest game evangelists and apologists uh, that I've ever seen in my life. And I thought I was a big pusher of games. Uh, ben puts me to shame. So, you know, in that spirit, uh, you know, certainly that is kind of what we're trying to do here. And I want to make it very clear uh, in the coming year, one, we are going to continue to produce Pathfinder 2 content. Uh, it's a big part of our channel. Uh, it's a big part of my sort of D20 gaming experience right now. And it's certainly a huge part of our Patreon. But that being said, um, you know, my, my motivation is a little bit different than No Nat. I know that No Nat very famously just said he's going to be stepping away from Pathfinder 2 to sort of focus more on video games. Um, my interest is not in stepping away from Pathfinder 2 to do something else. It's that, I mean, I think you all know that I've been I've been streaming for months and months and months behind a wall of role playing games. Uh, my interests have always gone far, far, far deeper than just one singular game. And I love having the opportunity to talk about them. I love having the opportunity to share them with you. And, you know, maybe maybe you won't like every game. Maybe you'll if, if one person finds one game that they say, that's exactly what I want. That's exactly what I've been looking for. This is really going to change the way that I play role-playing games and give me a very unique, a different experience. Then, then the whole process will have been worth it. And... It goes without saying that obviously the generosity of your tips and your donations and your YouTube memberships are a huge part of that. 
and of course the Knights of Last Call Patreon. Getting the support from these almost 300 strong Patreon is what allows me to make videos and make live streams and not really worry about how many views it gets. Um, I'd rather make a video that gets a few thousand views, but it finds the handful of people out there who are looking for something different. Now, as I said, coming in the next year, we're gonna continue to produce Pathfinder 2 content. It's gonna continue to be a part of our channel. It's gonna be continue a part of our ongoing series, Combat and Tactics. I'm editing a Pathfinder 2 Combat and Tactics video right now. That'll be out this week. But I also wanna talk about other role-playing games. I probably will even talk about D&D some. Uh, I really wanna make sure that uh, I'm doing a, I don't know, a good service to everyone and not to sound too conceited on myself. This will sound very conceited. Um, I've played and run and own and read a ton of role-playing games and I've been to, uh, you know, 30 or 40 Gen Cons and Origins and I've talked with people and I've read the history books and you know, I'm, there are plenty of people out there with better gaming credentials than me, uh, especially people who've you know been published multiple times. And I'm sure John Harper or um, you know Avery Alder could come in here and, and obviously school me completely. Um, but you know, from my perspective, I have a unique viewpoint that maybe a lot of other people on YouTube don't have, which is this has been my life for about thirty years straight, and I have been really really deep in the weeds on it so i think that my my perspective could be a little bit different than other people's so um so again thank you welcome um i i hope that you get something valuable out of this please if you're if you're liking if you're following this if you're interested in this please like subscribe and, and leave a comment um you know what are some games that you might be interested in seeing a, a first look on that I maybe have not ever seen before. And maybe that'll be something that we'll do in the future. Um, I don't know how often we'll do this. Maybe, you know, maybe once a month or something like that would be, I think a, a fun place to start. But again, I, I do want to start trying to do some other things and, and this is part of it. So, um, uh, Rick says, uh, Rick says traveler. And honestly, that's probably a great example um i don't think i i own like a very old edition of traveler but i've really never played it and it's been so long it might as well count as a first look and i'm sure that the updates that have come uh since i read the book late you know uh last uh probably make it very 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 uh different game experience so that actually that's actually not a bad idea rick all right so today uh we're gonna do a first look here at um uh at broken compass uh, damien says i've certainly tipped enough for cofd or sentinel comics first looks damien williams you know what we'll do that sentinel comics first look i think that'd be awesome i have not you've you've hyped me up on that system for a long time i love superhero games and while um i may continue to just you know troll you on this on the chronicles of darkness i, I do think sentinel comics is probably worth the first look um so Broken Compass, uh, it was a Kickstarter from 2021, uh, so last year. And the game uh, obviously is uh, kind of, you know, from the, the description of it, is promising sort of pulp adventure in the style of Indiana Jones or um, Uncharted or The Mummy, the one with Brendan Fraser. And, you know, the, right off the bat, we've got this cover that's sort of this faux leather journal. And I definitely think that, you know, I, I think this will be a very interesting game. Um, okay. Uh, first, the, only, the first thing we see here is this manual is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. The only thing on the first page. So uh, very interesting. Um, okay. So here we have here. It's produced by Simon, Cool Mini or Not. Um, that's the one who uh, produced it. And again, it was originally by uh, 2LM Press. Uh, a bunch of Italian names. So this is an Italian game. Very interesting. Cultural references uh, inspired by the great sagas of our childhood. Mummy trilogy. Loved them. Loved Brendan Fraser. Loved Rachel Weiss in those movies. The third one wasn't as good, but I think we all agree to that. But the first two Mummy movies were just just the, the, the very definition for me of just popcorn films, fun to watch, just and fantastic. 
Um, Indiana Jones, of course, I loved it. And as always, the fourth one was pretty bad. Uh, but the first three are treasures, and I loved them growing up. Jumanji, RIP Robin Williams, National Treasure, and even other gems like Romancing the Stone, which is more of an 80s thing, but again, movies that I loved. And in video games in these things, such as Tomb Raider, Uncharted, Assassin's Creed. So I, I think I think we can all feel the sort of inspiration that they were going for. And I got to say, these are movies that I, uh, you know, that I love, um, that I, I I grew up loving and, and I would love to see uh, <laughs> uh, a game about. I, I, I got interested many years ago when I was first getting into Fate with a Fate game called Spirit of the Century that some of you may be familiar with. And Spirit of the Century was sort of based on kind of a similar presence uh, or similar premise, but it never really... Uh, I never really worked out with it. All right, so here's our contents. We've got a 200 and looks like it's a 234 page book. Um, uh, ben is saying, oh, this game is very spirit of the century, uh, but better. Okay, all right, that's good. I like it. Um, so we've got a 234 page book here. Looks like the final 20, 30 pages are some sort of uh, intro scenario, which is cool. First section, we've got talking about basically what are your role-playing games, maybe setting, this is this is good, this is agenda setting. This is telling you what is this game about? What are the adventures about? How do you play it? What is this game used for? So again, going back to those Jared Sorensen questions, the first thing is, what is your game about? I like a game that is very direct and clear and talks to you and says, this is what your game is about. The next 30 pages look to be in section two about creating your adventurer. We'll get into that, but uh, it looks like you're gonna have some weapons, some gear, uh, and some information about your character, which is cool. Section three, uh, maybe is sort of more of the meat and potatoes. Maybe this is the opposite side of the adventure. These are the challenges, which seems to probably be the main way that you engage with uh, you know, encounters or difficulties. Section four talks a little bit more about some of the rule specifics around traps, a luck coins, which might be some form of Benny or, or fate point or hero point. Uh, it looks like we get some information here about how combat works with brawl and shootout rules. And then section five looks like it's all about how to craft, create and run an adventure. And then lastly, section six looks like it talks about some of the different area eras, themes, or genres that you might use this rule system for. So first pass seems like it's got a really great approach to the structure of the game. Um, I'm always kind of iffy about like character creation before learning the rules. I understand that that's how they put it in chronological order, but sometimes I wish they could kind of teach you the rules first and then you can create characters, but I understand that's kind of awkward to do, so. Um, I, I stole this art for the <laughs> thumbnail. Uh, what a cool, amazing piece of artwork. Very, very evocative. We've got, you know, the, the Jeep on fire, machine guns, the the sort of Indiana Jones, um, whoever the guy's for name from Uncharted is, uh, jumping down off to, after some sort of Mesoamerican coin. Very cool. Um all right, Broken Compass is a role-playing game in which players assume the roles of adventurers in search of treasure. Okay, so that is our core premise. Uh, thank you, Ben. Nathan Nathan Drake, that is exactly who I was thinking of. Um, that image is pure Broken Compass. Yeah, I mean, this this image, I think, is, you know, and this, I, I, I you all know I'm a big fan of art, and, uh, you know, one thing I need to do before it gets too late is I need to go buy some prints from you know from jeff easley and larry elmore and get them signed and get them framed because art is such a huge component for me for role-playing games it always has been but you know art like this it, it, it for me it helps sell the game it helps explain the game like if you show somebody that and you say does that look cool to you then this might be a game for you so all right uh, so we've got this core premise here. It's a role-playing game in which players assume the roles of adventurer in search of a treasure, capital T, okay? So this isn't just generic treasure. This isn't just random, you know, gold or dollars. This is the big T, the big treasure. And that's our core premise of the game. Um, just we are adventurers and we are searching for these legendary treasures. We get that with just the first line or sentence. 
Um, adventurers in Broken Compass are men and women of action traveling the world to face the challenges. I love how they are using their game terminology here with capital letters. Um, challenges, with my guess, is going to be a, a, as a form of of play pattern, like almost like an encounter might be in a D20 game. Uh, adventurers risk their lives every day, driven by their will to discover, learn, or obtain something priceless to them. Uh, it is based on the fortune system, which I do not know. Uh, I'm assuming it's unique to this game, or maybe it's unique to this company. A set of game uh, mechanics that uses a small pools of six-sided dice. From now on, a D6 to determine the outcome of any task that might entail risk or end in accidents. And we got a little bit here about the world of Broken Compass. Again, um, talking about uh, exploring a, a, you know, exotic and dangerous and awesome world from, you know, an abandoned monastery in a, in a steep and snowy mountain to a shipwreck at the bottom of the ocean all across the Americas, Asia, Europe, Oceania. Um, and uh, I like it. Um, and I, again, here. Uh, <laughs> maybe the you know it's saying look it's the world but it, make it whatever you want it to be so i like that um <laughs> as if we needed more artistic uh, uh tropes here we've got a clear sort of uh reflection of the of the 1930s adventurer on the left and the 1990s adventure i love how it says edgy <laughs> edgy scarf and this person on the left obviously clearly looks like brendan fraser right straight out of the mummy which is a fantastic movie um so where and when and again this is good. This is tone setting. This is explaining to us that this game isn't about maybe, uh, you know, doing romantic high school romantic love triangles. Um, it's trying to tell us what the game wants to be about and what's it, what's it good at. Um, so your adventurer can start in a city you visited, your hometown, or you can spin a globe. You don't really need to know the location as much as you need to understand it. Okay. Each region of the world has its own customs and traditions, its climates and social norms. Variety is the spice of the world. Whatever, wherever you decide to go, do your best to make the place unique and unprecedented. And I think that's just good advice for any adventuring game. Um, and uh, <laughs> Shadram says it's about the archaeological love triangles. I mean, I'm not opposed to an archaeological love triangle there, Shadram, but we'll see. We'll see if it can handle this. Um and, uh, you know, just good advice, I think, in general for most adventuring games. I think a lot of people make adventures and they put them, I mean, you know, you are you are only constrained by your imagination. Uh, whether you're using VTTs or, or you're using something else. Like, you could have your dungeon be anything. It could be, you know, in a volcano. It could be in the, the bones of a dead god. It's like, you know, why don't we just put it? we just put it in the ground you know like thing adventure should be fantastical I, I don't i don't dislike that idea so um once you know where you are you better ask when you are um a good indicator could be your clothes if you're wearing khakis a shirt and a hat or a long shirt you could be in the middle of the two wars and if the jeans reach below your heels you're way ahead in time um so looks like the game is basically saying um you know, sort of the 1930s and the, the 1990s are sort of their two primary uh, focuses of area, eras here. And they say a whole different expansion entitled The Golden Age will be dedicated to the 30s. So I guess they did an expansion just dedicated to that part. But um, so, yeah, you know, understand where you're, where you're playing and when you're playing. All right. Adventure is the cornerstone of Broken Compass, and the cornerstones are travel, discovery, and action. Um all right, so are these phases or are these sort of talking about the genre or the themes of the adventure? Um, travel. It doesn't matter if you're going to the other side of the country or to the Guatemalan jungle. The important thing is setting foot outside your house. Uh, a lot of this stuff has happened. A true adventure knows legs are making of walking. So travel is an important part of the game, right? We are going to be in Indiana Jones. We are flying the map scene, right? We are going to places far away. We are going to places that are difficult to get to. We are discovering. We're meeting new people, new cultures. We're unearthing the wonders and mysteries all around us. And lastly, act, action, act. Um, 
You're not the only youngster with high hopes, an arrogant smirk, and a leather jacket. Treasure is out there, and rest assured, everyone's looking for it. If you want to get there first, you're going to need to roll up your sleeves and get dirty. Action is the spice of life. The only Remember, the only thing that matters is the adventure, and the adventure is now. Again, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but I feel like this is telling us an important lesson. It's saying, look, this game is about Indiana Jones or Nathan Drake, you know, during the movie. It is not going to focus on what they are doing between the movies. It's not going to focus about their day job. This is about the adventure. This is about the action. This is about the excitement. And it is strongly encouraging you to do so and focus on that. And again, I think that's totally fair and totally legit. Um, yes, I agree, Shadram. There better be world maps. <laughs> there better be world maps with planes moving around red lines. I mean, uh, I got to admit, you know, I like playing in person, but you know, that that's the type of thing that if I was playing virtually, I would love to have created a sort of, uh, you know, uh, an image or something that I could draw on like a world map and, and you could just draw the the red line as you move across the map. I did something similar to that in Rise of the Rune Lords when the um, uh, the group took the Yandabakari River up from the sort of Magnamar and the Sandpoint Coast, and they went into the interior towards the um, oh gosh, goodness the Storval Deep. Um, I had this sort of you know you know drawing, uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, ben says, Derek nailed it. This is pedal to the metal action. Okay, great. All right. So that, and by the way, that informs us of what we can expect in forms of the mechanics and everything else and how they're going to sort of work it together. Um, all right. To start your adventure, you need a sheet of paper and a pencil and a handful of G6s, said every RPG since the 1970s. And one of you will need to be the fortune master. I'm going to roll my eyes at that one. Just call it a game master. You don't need to call it a fortune master. Game master is not uh, is not copyright. You can just call it a fortune game master. You don't have to call it a fortune master, but whatever. Uh, basically, fortune master is your game master. They play as all the extras. So that's okay. So we, we, we see here, again, it's bold. It's capitalized. But we are seeing here the distinction between two types of NPC, right? We're seeing extras and we are seeing rivals. So extras are probably going to be your unimportant background characters, maybe your your mooks or your minions. And rivals are likely to be that sort of, you know, the Belloc character from Indiana Jones or the, um, uh, what's her name? From the third movie, goodness gracious. The uh, Austrian blonde. Um, you know, that that's going to be your sort of recurring character, the villain that you have this sort of relationship with and isn't just a pushover. Um, everybody else is an adventurer, searching out for adventure. <laughs> They're very clear about this again. Um, generally, adventurers act and speak in response to the scenes that the fortune master stages. Sometimes, for example, when risks need to be taken or when they are presented with unforeseen circumstances, adventurers can use their skills and roll a number of D6s to determine if luck is on their side. So. You know, so far, so far, it sounds like you're going to be given a challenge. You're going to have to use your skills, a bit of creativity, roll some dice, see if you did see what see what happens. Uh, and then you have a character sheet called an adventurer sheet. Um, after determine, okay, so this is interesting here. This section called playing together. After determining the roles of fortune master and adventurers, you can forget them. Bold. Interesting. Don't think, okay, I like, they're coming out here with strong language. Don't think of being the fortune master as a responsibility or that adventurers just go, just get to be spoon fed the story and roll some dice. You are creating this story together. All of you. I mean, obviously this is language that I very much agree with. Um, but to, to come out and to say it so explicitly in the beginning of the book I think is great. Before starting an adventure, talk about it. Choose where you are, what the treasure is, and why you are looking for it together. Choose what ties the adventurers to one another and who will be your rival if you know them. Once the journey begins, be proactive and open to ideas. This is not just some excursion, it's an adventure. 
and any adventure worth its salt is made of opportunities to seize and accidents to deal with. And of course, it's an RPG, so have fun. Um, I love it. I love that, you know, they're, they're, this is true of all role-playing games, but I, I you know, maybe to nowadays we have to be a little bit more explicit and tell people that it's okay for you to have input on the game and it's actually required for you to have input um, on the game. Um, Pumpkin says that uh, he loves this, and uh, I agree. And Frostjack, I agree. More RPGs need language like this at the beginning of the book. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, so, again, this is kind of an extension of this playing together. And, boy, I'm loving the language here. Now, I understand this isn't technically part of what I would call uh, the game, but it is definitely a part of the philosophy of the game. And, you know, you could technically put this in anywhere, but here we go. Share the world. If you're the fortune master, if you're the game master, <laughs> and an adventurer asks you, do I know a pub in town where I can get this information? Consider the situation and don't just answer yes. You're like, oh, is this saying, say screw you? No. Allow the adventurer to be the one who describes the pub and who they hope to find there. It's easier. I cannot stress this enough. It is easier on you both, and you will be sharing the world and the fun. And oh my God, this is everything. Like, absolutely. Um, I, I can't tell you how powerful this is as a tool, as a game master. Sharing the world. Love it. Um, it, 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 it is fantastic. Every time I have ever played a very open, free game and someone makes like a recall knowledge check or something like that, and I they ask me what I know, and I say, you know, why don't you tell us? Who who is it? Who is this person? Uh, and they say, Oh, they're they're the world's most foremost expert in this. They're gonna be able, able to really help us. And I go, Yeah, they are. That's awesome. How do you know them? Um, um, I used to be, you know, I grew up, I went to school with uh, their son and you know we were best friends growing up we were on the lacrosse team together and he was the coach it's like okay cool awesome let's go with that you know what maybe it's not Shakespeare maybe it's not the mo maybe you're not critical role you're not Laura Bailey you're not Travis or, or 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 any of those people but it's like it doesn't matter you know it's your game and I promise you that your shitty awkward game that you make yourself is going to be better than the pre-packaged, published, real smooth, really slick, really flashy one that you're just struggling to keep up with. Um, and also, I completely agree. It, it just it makes it so much easier to be a GM, to not always have to be on and always have to be thinking. So I love that advice. Um, whether you're a fortune master or an adventurer, listen to your friends. Okay, yep, this is great. Be open. Um, if you know where you're from and where you're going, Oh my God, this game. Look at this. Man, this is my new, this is my new Bible. I mean, I don't know if I'll like the game, but I, I love the language in the setting here. If you know where you're from and where you're going, then you don't need to play. What is the point of playing your character? If you already know everything there is to know about your character, you've already completely mapped out their background. You've already completely mapped out their build. You've already completely mapped out their arc. You're just, what, sitting around now, waiting for it to happen? This is fantastic advice. You know, even when it comes to backgrounds, you characters can have backgrounds. Start today. Start in the middle. Start at the present. As we go forward, we learn about your character's future as it happens. But we also learn about your character's past. Fill in those details as time moves forward. Use flashbacks. Use, you know, those, those scenes around the campfire where you share your past with the players. Leave it open. Leave it open to interpretation. Uh, the best adventures are those who set out an adventure without knowing what their destiny will be. Maybe not even who they really are. So this is just fantastic. Um, if... On the 10th day of your adventure, a friend pops out talking about that time you saved their life 10 years ago. Just roll with it. Fantastic. If you're, the fortune master brings back your elder brother who your adventurer believed dead, and maybe you didn't even know anything about it, 
roll with it. And you know, ah, uh, uh, mm, people, I'm smiling because when you play a game like this, uh, not just Broken Compass, but when you play any game like this, the smiles that will be around your table are just uh, are just so good. Like when you tell somebody, it's like, oh, it's your long lost brother who you thought was dead this whole time, which is why you've never mentioned him. And he's like, oh, whoa, it's just so fun. And, you know, maybe it's specifically for this style of game. It builds into the camp. But, you know, most of our games get pretty campy anyways. All right. So this is fantastic. Leave all your prejudices. Leave all your expectations at the door. A true adventurer must have the strength to let the discoveries contradict and marvel them. Assuming how things will end, uh, uh, assuming how things will end is a road that only leads to disappointment. Um, that is probably the best advice I can ever imagine giving it. Um, you know, and also just here randomly on the sidebar, leave things to chance. Sometimes it's fun to just decide things together, but sometimes it's better to let luck take the wheel. If you feel like you're really ready for anything, just randomly roll. <laughs> okay. I love it. Okay. Um, make room, man, going just right to the heart here. Um, not everything is about you. Sorry to say this. Not everything is about you. It's fantastic. This is a lesson we all assume we will have learned, but sometimes we just forget. Sometimes the story will require a few adventurers or maybe just one of them to be in the spotlight for a while. You might not be one of them. You will be one of them sooner or later, but not all the time. Have fun listening to others and learning about your friends. Be transported to the world. Watch them grow. Watch them have an amazing experience. We were just talking about this, I think, on the other stream where I said, look around the table and ask yourself, am I contributing to the fun of this, of this table? Or am I just taking? Am I just a consumer of content? Or am I making enjoyable experience for others in the table around me? So fantastic stuff. I mean, just beautifully fantastic stuff. Ryan, we will catch you later, buddy. Thank you for stopping in. Thank you for your support. Glad you could you glad you could stop in. Um, so just all in all, these last two pages have been some of the best not even GM advice, but just some of the best RPG advice I've ever read in my life. Um, obviously, these are things that you know we've talked about for many times here on the channel, but I, again, have to tip my hat to the authors for being able to write it out so succinctly and so uh, expertly. It's just fantastic stuff. Um, all right, so we got a little bit here of an adventure of example of narration back and forth between some players. Yeah, well, we can skip that, but, you know... I'm sure it's just some role-playing stuff here. So we're still going through the touchstone stuff here, just like the movies. Um, <laughs> Frosty, it's it's not, it's not all about me. Unsubscribe. That's right. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes when you play with a group of players, you got to, you know, be willing to let other people have the moment in the sun, and I think that's totally fine. Um, all right. Uh, for normal people, life is not like the movies, but for adventurers, it is. All right. Again, um, setting the tone here and continuing this theme, uh, which is each game session is like an episode of a season of your favorite TV series with you in the role of the protagonist. When we used to play Mutants and Masterminds in our comic books, we referred to them as seasons and we referred to them as episodes and it really, uh, or issues, I'm sorry, we referred to them as issue and um, volume, sorry, not seasons, episodes, but we called them, you know, volume one, issue three. And that really helps set the tone. Um, once you get together with your friends, you are living in an episode. One after the other, the episodes will take you from the beginning of the adventure to the finale. And um, so it's kind of, you know, this idea of really structuring the game. You know, each adventure is sort of this one-off episode where the action rises, and action falls, it resolves, and you have a series of adventures, uh, and then you get to a finale, and maybe you play another season, but it has like a different arc or different take to it. I, I really like that idea. Um, I see you're eager to jump into an adventure. Don't worry. The on-demand episodes are designed to be easily altered and adapted to your needs. So that's what they call their pre-written adventures. I'm guessing is on-demand episodes. Um, and all expansions will contain a new season and several. Okay. So, you know, new campaigns and new pre-written adventures. So they're just talking about this. Um, Pilot, 
not sure how to tackle the season, play a pilot. Pilots are special introductory episodes that could take place months or even years before the rest of the season. They explore the reason that led you to become an adventurer or drove your crew together for their first gen uh, journey. Pen and paper at hand, fill your sheets and start your adventure without needing much else. At the end of the pilot, feel free to change and make sessions here. So it's kind of like a session zero and a session 0 0.5. It's like, it's mostly you making characters, but it's also, um, you know, this idea that, you know, this is like a pre-adventure to sort of uh, test, you know, test the tires, kick the tires on your character sheet and see where they're, you know, if you need to change things. Um, okay, here we go here. Follow the broken compass. Um, so this is about supernatural stuff. Um, you know, I think it's basically saying that it's, uh, you know, talking about how the supernatural, this isn't just a, you know, a uh, uh, real world game. There's mummies, there's curses, there's hallucinations, there's sandstorms. Um, and so the supernatural element of the game is an important part of the game. And, you know, you, we, we think of Indiana Jones and it, you know, we think of it as almost being kind of gritty and realistic, but it's not, it, it's very supernatural, but it's rooted in sort of a realistic way. They never trivialize it. And I think that's what I think they're trying to basically impress around here. So. Um, I think that's pretty cool. All right, so that's section one, and now we're into section two. So now we're actually going to get into the meat potatoes of how we make an, a character. And again, just leather jacket, dual wielding nine millimeter Glocks, um, you know, backpack, little scarf. Apparently, that's a must have. Um, so, all right. So some more advice about your case. A lot of, uh, you know, not a lot of stats or statistics or anything like this. It's it's mostly been about tone and tone and genre and, and all that other stuff. <clears throat> um, all right. So this is something I know that uh, Smith talks about a lot, which is don't make a character that isn't an, an, an that is not an adventure. If you're playing in D and D, the game is a fantasy adventure game. I understand that your character wouldn't do this. Your character would stay at home and they would continue to, you know, uh, try to be a successful writer or author. That's not the adventurer's fault. That's your fault. You made a bad character. Um, you know, your character has their eyes on the treasure. They're looking for something. They are searching. They are questing. Uh, they're, you know, oh, this is fantastic right here. Look at this. Explorers, archaeologists, grave robbers, amateurs. There's plenty of people in the world looking for treasures, but that doesn't make them adventurers. To find adventure, you need to be willing to leave everything behind and even put your life at risk, right? Your character isn't just some, you know, Susie Nobody or some Joe Schmo. You are a adventurer. You take risks, big risks, up to and including your life. Um, and then lastly, you know, when the stakes get high, uh, they're, you know, the places you're going are full of skeletons of people who went looking for treasure and were willing to end up like that in, in order to find it, you're different. So it's sort of building on this, this premise. You're like, no, no, your character wants to find treasure. And you're like, okay, but a lot of people look to find treasure. Yeah, but your character's willing to take the big risks and, and really go out there and risk, risk, risk life and limb. And it says, okay, yeah, but there's a lot of people who wanted treasure and risk their life and limb. And now these places are full of skeletons, but you're different. Um, Adventurers are men and women of action. It doesn't matter whether you're a soldier or a high school Spanish teacher. It doesn't matter whether you're a skilled mountaineer or if you break a sweat after a first flight of stairs. The only thing that matters is that today you're ready for action. So you have the skills that you need to get yourself out of these troubling situations. So while you may seem to be an ordinary person, the game is basically telling you, you have the game world, the rules, the, the, the structures of this game are going to support you being an adventurer. And I think this is important because I don't want to like get off on a, too much of a, of a tangent here, but you know, if you look at a game like BX D and D, um, you know, it's like, Oh, you're an adventurer, but you know, you also just kind of die instantaneously, <laughs> you know, the moment you, you touch poison or if something, you know, if you fall down a pit trap or if a skeleton stabs you, it's, it can be a little bit jarring. You're like, okay, maybe I'm not this, flying high heroic adventurer that I think I am, right? I've got to be more of like a cautious um, um, kind of scoundrel or mercenary. 
And I think this game is trying to say that, you know, you're taking these big risks and you're trying to go for this treasure and these game rules are designed to support that. So one of the things that we're going to be looking for as we go through this section is, do they accomplish that? All right. So here is our character sheet. Uh, I am blank. Call me if you need a blank places. I call home your heritage, your homeland, your workplace, a little character portrait section words to live by. We've got a luck meter and a luck coin. We've got uh, some descriptors, which are probably conditions that range from like a, a bonus to a penalty. We have some expertises that maybe we get some bonuses to our gear or weapons and gear. These look to be our skills. And we've got what's in our pockets, our equipment, and we have scars and experience. So character sheet tells us a lot about our characters. So um, definitely something that we want to kind of uh, uh, keep in mind here. But on first pass, this looks pretty great. We'll see what we got here. Um. Unfortunate Pumpkin says, I love the supernatural aspects of Indiana Jones and Uncharted that usually don't show up till the end. Yeah, it's always very subtle, Pumpkin. You know, Indiana Jones isn't like fighting his way through, you know, hordes of undead. But, you know, you get to the end of, you know, uh, Last Crusade and suddenly the grail is real and there's a ghost that's been there for, you know, 600, 700 years. You know, the Ark comes to life and 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 kills everybody, right? It's, it's this kind of really cool crescendo moment. Bill, good to see you, buddy. All right. So I am, this doesn't need, so this is your name, uh, plus your, you know, surname or, you know, Professor, Professor, Professor Hardways. <laughs> um, call me if you need a describe. Okay. Describe yourself using two tags from the tag list. For example, you could be a daredevil action hero, a hunk soldier, or a rebel pilot. This um, this really reminds me of Danger Patrol, which is a game that John Harper made. Um, and um, uh, let me see if I can pull this over here. Let's see. It's kind of funny that it's uh, it's like that. Um. So this is uh this is Danger Patrol. Uh, in Danger Patrol, was this is like a super light, super indie game, uh, but I love it. We always loved it. And when you made a character, you actually you printed these out beforehand. You cut them out, and you you cut out all the things on the left. So alien. Atomic, Ghost, Intrepid, Mystic, Psychic, Robot, Two-Fisted. And then you also cut out the, the cards on the right. Explorer, Flyboy, Detective, Daredevil. And then you shuffled them up and then you dealt them out randomly. So like your character might end up being, you might get the Intrepid card and then you might end up getting Flyboy. So you're an Intrepid Flyboy. Or maybe your character is a Psychic Warrior, right? That, that's how you kind of like made your your pulp action hero for this. Or maybe, you know, maybe you were a two-fisted uh, commando or a two-fisted agent, you know? It's kind of cool. Anyways, it reminds me of that. And I love that game, so fun stuff. Um, so we're going to be picking our tags. So we'll see what that does. That's pretty cool. And then we have our place to call home. So heritage, homeland, and workplace. Um, your heritage represents your place and culture. It's where your parents are from. You may have never been there, but it's where your roots are. Your homeland is where you grew up. And your workplace represents the country to which you moved for professional purposes. So, for example, you might be a U.S. citizen born to African parents who moved to Egypt to study the Valley of Kings. You might be a Brit born and bred in England from English parents and only feel at home in the United Kingdom. But adventurers tend to be citizens of the world. And then lastly, and we have these words to live by. A sentence describing what you believe in or that guides you during your adventure. I don't know if this has any game effect yet, but, uh, you know, again, I think it's just trying to really set the tone for your character. Um, and I think that's totally fine. I'm interested in what these tags do. All right. We'll probably come back to this page a lot because I want to see these, this character sheet. All right. So we got luck. We've got a track system here. 
this number. It says luck coin, so we'll see what this says. This is, again, why sometimes I wish they would show you what the rules are before they tell you how to make a character. Um, you could be as good as you want, with, but without a luck, you're not surviving out there. This section on your sheet dedicated to luck. We get luck points and luck coins. Okay, so that it's two separate resources. Luck points reflect how much luck you have left before being out of luck, which is a condition. On your sheet, these are represented by these 10 white dots. Okay. Every time you lose luck, you fill in one of the dots from left to right. And when all the dots are filled, you're out of luck. Okay, so this might be like hit points. Um, maybe. We haven't really seen anything else here, which looks like it is some sort of uh, damage tracker. Um, and so instead of using something like fatigue like some of the new Powered by the Apocalypse games like Root and Avatar, all the stuff from Magpie has been using kind of fatigue. Um, it's possible that luck is maybe your character's, uh, you know, version of of hit points and, and sort of represents you maybe having bad rolls, which cost you luck. We'll see. But it's, again, it's, it's a good flavor. It's a good tone. Uh, luck coin. Each adventure has one or more luck coins. A luck coin can save you when you're out of luck or grant you success for any desperate or very dangerous actions. The number of luck coins you can have or you have can be noted on the inside of the coin on your sheet. We'll talk about these later, but it sounds like luck coins are sort of your, uh, you know, your hero points, your bennies, like your ability to get out of, uh, of a tricky or trouble or problematic situation. Um, Unfortunate. We'll see you later and go and play some Magic the Gathering. I don't know whether to say salute or or to pity you. Hey, I just want to say, everybody, by the way, thank you for joining us. Uh, I've got about 25, 26, 27 people here. So hopefully you're enjoying this. Um, if you have any thoughts or questions, um, you know, um, we'll probably just kind of save that to the end. Uh, I plan to go till about 9 o'clock, but I'll probably try to let, wait the last half an hour or so um, in order to do sort of a QA and a and kind of talk about it, final thoughts with you in the chat just so we can get through it. But if you do have a pressing thought or comment or question and you want to interrupt me, uh, that's where I would really encourage you to use super chats or I would encourage you to use tips um, just to get, uh, get to get you know my attention. Um, I agree, Frost Track. 27 is not bad viewing. Um, that's about as many as we had for our last Quest for the Frozen Flames game. So, I mean, obviously, we you know, if I do something about D&D &D or or fourth edition D&D &D or something like that. We're going to get more people, but I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I think it's better than, it's like Legend of the Five Rings numbers. I'm, I'm happy with that. All right. Ben is telling us that words to live by does do something. So we'll get that. Um, all right. I feel. So this is a section that I think is really interesting. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so people at, at home can see this better. Um, so we've, we've got these conditions that track to the actions we've got action or I should say the skills we've got action skills gut skills knowledge skills society skills wild skills crime skills and they kind of have this what looks to be a positive and a negative so I'm really interested about how that works and 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 what effect that's going to have on the game um you might find yourself collecting good and bad feelings which will influence your ability to face challenges and dangers Good feelings are lifted on the left side of our sheet and grant an advantage on all tasks in a certain field. In the right column, you can find bad feelings, which will give you a disadvantage. Now, we don't know exactly what that means yet, but each column in the I feel section also has two empty lines where you can note any feelings that aren't standard or were specifically created by the fortune master. We'll talk about these later, but I like the idea of, you know, you know, if your character's feeling powerful, they are going to get a benefit to fight and lead and do stunts. If our character is feeling uh, dizzy or or uh, shook up, uh, you know, shocked, they're going to have a hard time to to act cool or drive or shoot a gun. If our character is feeling um, broken, they're going to have a hard time surviving or toughing it out. But if they're confident. They're going to have a great advantage to charming or being eloquent or observing what's going on around them. So that's very cool. 
I mean, I'm really interested to see how that works. Um, I love mechanics which allow us to reward and again, I don't know what the rules are going to be about this, but having a way to physically and mechanically represent a character's state um, is, I think, a really great way to increase role playing at your table. Um, when a series of events occurs and a character ends up, you know, being um, embarrassed in a situation, um, you know, that's fine. You could have that on your character sheet. But, you know, even if you're not using, you know, fluffy bullshit time, it, you know, it's kind of tough to like, well, what does that actually mean in the game? It doesn't really mean anything. And we're so used to having these conditions in the game only really re re rely to combat stuff. But if suddenly your character is embarrassed and you give them this condition and they embarrass is a great way. It's a great role playing cue of how to play your character. But even if you don't do that, it's going to have this mechanical effect on your society checks. And I think when people see the direct connection between their character's emotional state or their character's thoughts and feelings and how that's affecting now the game world, I think that's a very powerful tool for pushing people to role play better. I really do. All right. Uh, expertise. These are our blank boxes on the right. Uh, whether you're hunting for treasures, you get uh, used to taking massive risks, but you always have some strengths that you can rely on. These are areas where you feel you're most in your element, techniques that you've learned by heart, and can be summed up by simple words like medicine, guns, seduction. So they're an element. They're a sort of a specialized version. You know, we've got a shoot ability. That could be guns. It could probably be... Um, a plane's missile systems, it could be a bow and arrow, but our character's expertise is in guns. These will allow us to re-roll any dice that were not successful. Each adventurer gets three of these. Two are determined by their tags that we chose for our character's uh, uh, call me if you need a, and we get one that we get to pick ourselves. Okay, very cool. Little way to make our characters different. Uh, Ben, thank you again for the tip. Thanks for stopping in. Thanks for the game recommendation and, uh, enjoy your seventh C game. Also a game of high adventure and, sh and swashbuckling fun. So, uh, Shadra, <laughs> uh, I have a good feeling about this said no Harrison Ford character ever. I caught like 20 minutes the other day of air force one. What a cool movie. Air Harrison Ford was such a badass. Um, all right. So here's the information about the skills that we had. Um, and I, we were right. They were called skills and these are, I don't think are anything that we would expect to be any different. Um, you know, fighting, eloquence, scouting, alerting, dexterity. Remember too, skills are a really great way of telling you, this is kind of what the game expects us to be doing. Uh, it expects us to be running, jumping, you know, having cool car chases, uh, you know, keeping our cool in danger, shooting bows, fighting hand to hand, uh, doing awesome stunts, um, being knowledgeable about cultures and technology, being sort of a James Bond esque ability, a uh, 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 sort of a man or a woman of of culture, being able to get along or survive in the crazy harsh wilderness and and amazing incredible um, environments, and you know maybe getting some some not so legit stuff, some skullduggery stuff out uh, uh, as well. So again, great way to sort of understand, hey, this is what the game is about and this is what the game wants us to do. I mean, a great way typically in most role-playing games is look where they, how much, look how much words and page space they spend on different aspects of the game. That's a great way the game is telling you, this is what this game is about. All right, weapons and gear. We'll get some stuff here. Um, looks like you can just write this whatever. There's no adventure in gear. Um, you just can write whatever you want. Some of these weapons and gear will give you one or more advantages for a task if you know how to use them. So you might write grappling hook and it says with rope can be used to hook or climb. All right. 
Um, it's a little, that's a little, I, I'm, I'm glad that there's not an inventory list or an inventory system, but that seems a little vague. Um, I don't like weapons and gear in games like this. I actually prefer them to be virtual uh, bags and gear. So maybe, maybe we'll, hopefully we can take a look at this, but um, like Blaze in the Dark uses sort of quantum gear, right? Your character, we don't know what they have until, you know, they, uh, they go out an adventure. Um, so inventory, uh, and any object that is neither a weapon nor a gear will end up in your inventory. You have three sections of inventory. We'll go back to the character sheet. You've got pockets, bag, backpack, and looks like you still have magazines. So somehow ammo is still a thing, <laughs> even in this game, which I'm probably going to poo poo on because I don't think you should be tracking ammunition, but maybe they do something really great here. So pockets contain everything that you can carry in a pocket or wear like a watch or a necklace or a lighter. You can't lose something that's in your pockets unless someone steals it. A bag is like a purse or a body bag or a small container. Bags don't hinder you, but they might be lost in some circumstances. And a backpack is for more of like a, you know, over like a hiking and, and doing some real exploring pots, pans, tent. Um, it's the largest, but it can be a hindrance in tasks and a burden. Um, and lastly, mags. You don't, okay. You don't need to keep track of how many bullets you have, but magazines are pretty handy. This section allows you to know how many mags you have and where you keep them. Bags and pockets can each hold up to two mags and a backpack can hold up to nine. So we don't exactly know how games work, but um, we'll see how they work. Damien says, I wish every game did ammo like Star Wars slash Genesis does. Uh, how does Star Wars slash Genesis do ammunition? And then last, the, the last thing on our character sheet, I think this is literally the last thing on our character sheet, is scars and experiences. As you complete your endeavors, your adventure will leave its marks on you in the shape of experience or scars, which will determine growth and development. So these are short sentences that you can write down on your sheet when the time comes, and this will be part of how our character grows and develops. So that's pretty cool. All right. So choose this is our adventure so remember we this is dr laura benoit and she gets to you have to choose two tags to describe your character so she has chosen explorer and professor so she is an explorer professor and then she writes down so each of these tags gets a field a backup field eight skills and expertise so this is basically how you build your character um this is going to determine what you uh, sort of what your starting skills are and what you get. Um, once you've chosen your tag, you write them down and, and we find them. So we can find a complete description here. So here we go. So remember, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 tags, which means that there are 306 different combinations of tags. Um, so... If I was playing, if I was playing, what would I choose here? Um, professor is fun. I do like that. Um, I don't, I probably would end up with something like an explorer professor. Um, I also like the idea of maybe being like a daredevil, daredevil pilot. That'd be kind of cool as well. Um, so you get, uh, a, you get a, depending on what you choose this tells you what what you get expertise in what your field uh, uh, uh field is what skills you get and that's it so remember we get three expertises we get two from our tags and one from our of our choosing um so if we look at our character here so like for example our, our dr laura benoit who is an explorer professor is going to get some um skills in leadership, culture, first aid, tech, eloquence, observation, alertness, and stealth, but is also going to get stunt, first aid, observation, scout, survival, toughness, alertness, and stealth. And they're going to get two expertise. They're either going to get archaeology or degree, or they're going to get, and they're going to get orienteering. And they're also going to get these two fields. So very cool. And in case you were wondering what these expertise reply to, they, they kind of hit tell you here orienteering like you know using a map finding your bearings you know using compasses and maps it's very cool okay so now we fill in the diamonds 
So we noticed before, e next to each field and skill, there are three diamonds. Some of them are already filled in, but most of them are blank. And we did notice that on the character sheets. That, um, yeah, that we've got, oh, Jesus. Here we go. So two are filled out here, 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 but all the rest uh, are one, 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 one. So I wonder if that's how many dice you roll. It is a dice pool system. Uh, in which case this would be very easy to do. So when you choose a tag, you can fill in a diamond for its field and one for each of its skills. You can normally ignore the backup field, which is the one written in parentheses, okay? You might choose two tags that give you the same field. When this happens, you can fill in a diamond in that field and one more in the backup field of your choice for one of the two tags. Okay, so for example, our explorer professor gets wild and knowledge. So if we come back to our sheet here, we can see that she has filled in the third diamond for wild and the third diamond for knowledge. And then anytime she got one of these skills, we marked it. And so you can see we've got first aid on both of these skills. And so first aid gets both of the diamonds filled. So our character is very knowledgeable and has a ton of first aid. So very simple, very easy. I, I think that's pretty great. Um, seems like it's a simple, easy way to, to make the character. Does this really support what we're doing? I mean, I think it's very, I mean, fundamentally, it doesn't look like you can really level up that much. So, I mean, our characters feel like they're starting off pretty damn proficient. Um, like they are... Uh, like, I don't know, this character seems like they're already maxed out or near maxed out. And even look at something like like she doesn't have a lot of success. You know, she doesn't have anything in, in action, but she already, you know, you start with two dice already. So that's very interesting. So it definitely kind of supports this idea that your character is uh, kind of a, you know, kind of a, kind of a badass. Um, all right. Once you fill in all the diamonds, you obtain your tags. You can personalize your sheet by adding in two more diamonds of your choice. So you get to just, and on top of that, you get to customize two more. So she put one into shoot and one into stunt. Okay, that's why they're yellow for the character sheet purposes, but that makes sense. When you find yourself facing a challenge, you roll a number of D6s equal to the number of your diamonds for that field plus those of the tested field. Okay, so that makes total sense. Um, now, what I wonder is, are these always the same? Like, if you're making a first aid check, is it always a knowledge check? Would I always roll six? Or would it sometimes be a guts first aid check? Because if that's the case, I love that. Because that's very uh, 2D20-ish very legend of the five rings ish um i love it when you can cross match one set of skills and one set of abilities so that you can really sort of reflect the fiction in the skill check um you know in pathfinder 2 i i, I talk about this all the time but like i love the idea and just in d20 in general i love the idea of using alternate ability scores for our skills that somebody might use wisdom to make a stealth check, or they might use intelligence to make a stealth check. I think that's really, really cool. Um, like if your character was going to try to sneak in to let's say a masquerade ball as a servant, but they were doing it not by hiding, but just by like blending in with the servant staff and donning a disguise, I would love to be able to say, make a stealth check, use charisma. I think that's always very, very cool. Um, Cardboard tomato. I can't remember if mixing and matching is in the rules or not, but I'm pretty sure that we played it that way when it made sense. Okay, well, we'll get to it, but I do think that's pretty interesting. Um, then we mark our expertise. We talked about this before. We get two from our tags, uh, and then we get one that we get to pick up. And again, if that uh, succeeds, or if we if, if our expertise applies, we get to re-roll failures. And then lastly, we mark one luck coin. So we start with one luck coin. All right. Um, oh, more just life advice, just like Budapest. And that's obviously a great reference to Black Widow and Hawkeye from the Avengers movies where 
you know, in several times throughout the course of the film, they would say, you know, this is just like Budapest. This is nothing like Budapest. And they never explain what Budapest is uh, at ever in the in the entire movies. But we get it. These characters have a history together. They go back. They've been through thick and thin. Um, and I love it. Whatever happened before today doesn't matter. The important thing is what's going to happen from now on. Writing an autobiography where you explain exactly what happened in your life to this day will not take you one step closer to the treasure. You can't waste time with these trifles. While playing, you create not only your future, but your past too. This is you know just like we explained it. Um, you can do it with a few words or small gestures to your companions. You can create chemistry, share your world, and be open to suggestion from others. If someone's shooting at your group and someone turns to you smiling and says, just like Budapest, answer the good old days. Or maybe don't get yourself in trouble this time. Or you and I remember Budapest very differently. Anyways, that's your past, not what you have written on a piece of paper. Give it a try. Uh, Damien is saying that Budapest is explained in the solo movie. You said capital solo. So I'm assuming you don't mean the Han Solo solo movie, but I'm assuming you mean the Black Widow movie or maybe the Hawkeye movie, in which case I have not seen those. So, or the Hawkeye TV series, but, um, all right. So then we note down some information. We get our gear and our character is done. So this character creation process seems like this should take, I don't know, probably less than 15 minutes. Uh, okay, okay, so Sean is saying Budapest was explained in the Black Widow movie. Well, boo. Boo, I say. Well, all the more reason. You can use it for many, many, many movies and then never explain it. But, you know, Marvel's so desperate to be relevant and come up with things people can go, oh, it's it's a, it's an Easter egg. It's a callback. Um. I thought you said I saw Black Widow and didn't like it. No, that is not true. I uh, I have not seen it. Um, I have not seen. Well, I don't have Disney Plus, so I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen uh, WandaVision or Falcon and the Winter Soldier or any of that stuff. But Willow is out and it's about to be the holidays. And I'm about to have some time off. and I really want to watch. Um, the Willow series. So I don't know. We'll see. I don't have time for TV shows or movies. I've got this channel. All right. Um, so this is about our items and gears. I'm not as concerned about this. Um, so here are some, okay. So they do have some ideas of common items, stuff that might be in your pockets or bag or backpack. So gear is a thing. All right. There's a little bit of gear porn here. Uh, that's actually a little disappointing to me. Um, not that it's bad. I, I mean, okay, it's it's one page. All right, I'll take it back. It's pretty light. All right. <gasps> Mostly because I don't want to get caught up in the minutia of, I, I don't want someone sitting there going, what should I bring? Should I bring the grappling hook or should I bring ice pick or should I bring the machete? Can I bring all of them? I just, that to me feels very counter purpose to what this game was trying to do. Um, and just, you know, gear acquisition syndrome and gear porn is not really what I feel like um, this should be about as much. But, you know, <laughs> Willow Watch Party. <laughs> I mean, listen, I've probably seen that movie, the original Willow. More time than any movie, uh, more movie, more times than any other movie in my whole life. So uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to be the best person to watch with this. I might be like, no, they're ruining it. Um, the thing about making your gear explicit is that the game is all about crazy action stunts. And when you don't have a thing, it just makes the stunts bigger. It's actually more fun. Uh, <laughs> Shadram says bring tux plus bow every time. Um if you had anything you wanted, you wouldn't have to improvise as much. Uh, cardboard table, that, that's probably a reasonable point. I just, you know, I understand how these games go sometimes. And I, I could see people getting, like, uh, obsessing and spending too much time planning. That's the only thing I'm worried about is people spending too much time planning. That's all. Um, interesting. So they have an age component here. 
Um, most adventurers are healthy adults in their prime, and importantly, they don't require parental consent to get on a plane and don't need to take a handful of pills every day. I said most, not all of them. Um, so you could be a young adventurer, you can be an old adventurer, or you could be a true adventurer. Um, if you get the same tag twice, you acquire the true tag. So if you're an action hero, action hero, you instead get to be a true action hero. In most cases, being a true action adventurer means you get one less expertise, but you start with two luck coins. Um, interesting. So the old character starts with more expertises and an, ex an experience or scar, but they have the permanent bad feeling called old. And uh, these have the current, you start with less, the young adventurer starts with less expertises, expertise, and they get the young uh, tag. Interesting. So an interesting way to sort of bring in this idea of, you know, the Sean Connery character who is probably not as spry as his young song, Indiana Jones, who is currently in the you know prime of his, uh, his life, but knows a lot more and has a lot more knowledge or experience. Um, it's a very cool uh, a game, a way to do that. Um, what is a game that does that really, really well? Um, where if you're older, maybe it's a torchbearer. I don't remember. There's some game where it's really, it handles. Oh, uh, um, forbidden lands, I think handles age really, really well. Um, yes. Do you want to be indie from the first movie or do you want to be indie from the fifth movie? <laughs> Oh, that fifth movie. What's it called? Dial of Destiny, I think is what they're calling it. So, um, all right. Uh, if you, okay, perfect. This is great. Fantastic. I have no idea what I want to be. I just want to roll for shit. <laughs> cool. Roll some dice. Perfect. This is great. There's always somebody in your group who doesn't know what to pick. They don't have any particular things. This is beautiful. They can just roll randomly, determine where you're from randomly, determine what your two tags are randomly, determine what your expertise is randomly, even determine what your words to live by randomly. I am so happy they put this in this book <laughs> because you know what? Some people need this. Some people want this. And I think it's great that this is in here. Fantastic. Okay, great. So um, this is perfect. All right, great. Okay. I mean, if this isn't a call out from Indiana Jones, I don't know what is. So we've made our character. We've got skills. We've got some expertises. What is? What are the challenges? What are we facing? Um, well, right off the bat, big sidebar here. Do or do not, there is no try. Um, when adventurers set their minds on something, they're going to find a way to do it. This is very much the we fail forward in this game. To fail a challenge doesn't mean you're left there in a glassy-eyed gaze uh, oh, okay, okay. Um, it's it's not only is it a fail forward, but it's also about something that I know that we talk about a lot here, which is your characters are competent. Don't make a fool of them. Um, you know, just because you fail doesn't mean you're making a fool of yourself. Failure could simply mean that things have gone differently from what you expected, and now you have to deal with accidents that have occurred. For example, if an adventurer is trying to burst through a door, failure doesn't necessarily mean that the door stands firm. You failed the check but you still break through the door, but you burst in right in front of the jailers that are on patrol. Um, failure is like any other part of the adventure. The only rule is keep it moving, live with the action and go on with the story. Success or failure make no difference. The adventure must go on. And this is an important life lesson. If you're playing a standard D20 game like Pathfinder or fifth edition D&D, and you're not going to fudge, which I don't think you should. You have to accept that the game rules do not support this style of play. D&D, &D, Pathfinder, these are the games you play where failure is an option, where there is a difference between success and failure, where the characters can get stuck because failure means failure in D20. Um, and part of the reasons these game systems exist like Broken Compass is because they wanted to create game systems that were better for telling these kind of stories 
because D20 based game systems don't do these very well. All right, so we're into the game. We got challenges. Um, so these are kind of any, we call any action and adventure attempts with a specific goal that could end in either, could end in an accident, a challenge. In other words, there has to be something at risk for it to be a challenge. Climbing a rock wall, shooting a target, translating an ancient manuscript. You're going to roll a number of D6 determined by the amount of diamonds that you have in the relevant field and skill and hope for the best. But remember, not everything is a challenge, which is important to note. Uh, you don't need to roll dice for every little thing. Um, so that, you know, pretty good, pretty standard rules here. Uh, accidents are the result of an action that ended badly in any way, leaving you somewhere you'd rather not be. For example... An accident for the challenge of translating the manuscript might be that you just need more time, not necessarily that you mistranslated it, which I really like here. A challenge that could end up with you hurt or worse is called a danger. But we'll talk more about that in Traps and Bullets. <laughs> I like this. When the fortune master decides you're facing a challenge, you need to do the following steps. Number one, don't panic. You can do it. Two, define your objective. Three, determine the difficulty of the challenge. Four, decide what skill is being brought to the test. Five, roll the dice count successes. Six, rejoice over your victory or deal with your failure. Seven, regardless of number six, keep going. The adventure must continue. All right, first, define your objective. You must be careful not to mix up what you're doing with the reason that you are doing it. You must be careful not to mix up what you're doing with the reason you're doing it. If you try to bust through a door, it's because you need to get in or out ASAP. If you get, translate a text, you're doing it because you need information. If you're trying a desperate move, it's because you need to get out of a tight spot. If you successfully overcome the challenge, everything goes as planned and you manage to reach the stated goal. Failing a challenge means the action you tried wasn't the right one or that it didn't lead to the desired outcome. To better manage success and failure, it is essential to understand what the objective you are trying to reach through the challenge is. So basically, I think what it's trying to say here is make sure that we understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, I don't want to break down the door. I'm trying to escape. I'm trying to get free. So we've got four categories, basic, critical, extreme, impossible. All right. Uh, that seems pretty easy to, to sort of assess. I like that. They've got these little two, three, four, five. Maybe that's what you had. That's how maybe that's how many successes you need. Uh, when you find yourself facing a challenge, you need to determine if it's going to be a basic critical or extreme or challenge. This is the job of the fortune master since they're the, the ones know, but I like this, but if the situation is controversial, it can Talk it out with the players and listen to their doubts. I love doing this. I love doing this in role-playing games. It's saying like, I don't know. This is a really tough spot, but what do you all think? And I know that there's people out there who are going to go, my players would just say it's basic. Well, then find new friends. Play with new people. That's the only, that's my best advice to you is find new friends, find better people. Um, Come, come join the Patreon, play with us. Uh, most challenges you will be facing are critical. Um, so the, the standard difficulty is critical. All right. The fortune master can decide not to disclose the difficulty of a challenge to the players, but they have to tell them the difficulty of any danger. So if life or limb is at risk, um, then I do have to tell you that, that, the what the, the danger is. Um, so we got to pick a skill. That seems pretty easy. What field to use. And, this is what we were talking about earlier, uh, which field to choose. In the vast majority of cases, skills have a relative field that they are already linked to. So most shoot tasks are going to be in guts, field stealth tasks are in the crime. But there are occasions, rare occasions, where the, the fortune master might require a skill to be put into a different field. So that makes total sense. Um, and I like that a lot. Um Uh, let's see. I think critical being the baseline helps calibrate the kind of stuff you should be expected to be doing and rolling for in this system. That's a great point. 
Uh, you know, if we look at critical, it's, you know, hitting a target at long range, translating an ancient and forgotten language, climbing a snowy mountain. Um, if that's the baseline difficulty in the game, that's a great point. Uh, it really kind of highlights what, you know, what we're doing and, and how we're doing it here. Um, very good point. So we've got our skill. Um, we can roll. We'll have three to six dice um, because a minimum number of dice we can have is three because we always start with two and one. Uh, each advantage gives you an additional die and each disadvantage removes one die. But you can never have less than two. And you can never have more than nine. Remember, we get advantages from having good feelings and we gain disadvantages from having bad feelings. In addition, I like this rule. This is a great, this is a great subtle way to do this. Um, I like this a lot. I really enjoy playing in games that give me a great tool to do exactly this. In addition, the fortune master has the right to grant an advantage if the adventurer does something clever, effective, or if they're in a position of clear superiority or strength. And similarly, I can apply them a disadvantage if they're doing something silly or in a clear position of inferiority. So if a character is about to do a shoot, you know, uh, uh, or make a shot and, you know, they're, they're lining up and they say, okay, I've got, you know, two dice or three dice from guts, two dice from shoot. That's five dice. And uh, they go, Hey, this is the, this is the distinctive moment by engaging with the game. You should reward them that you say, Hey, Derek, you said the weather is really windy. Right. And I say, yeah, that's, that's true. He's like, can I wait until there's like a lull in the wind and, a, 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 you know, to try to line up my shot so that the air is perfectly still or something. I don't know. I'm just making this up. But it's like, yeah, that's a great idea. And here's an advantage dice. And you get to have an additional die. You're, you're, you're responding to them engaging with the fiction with a mechanical benefit. And I love games that do that. Um, so um, after determining the number of dice, you roll and calculate strength. Well, let's see how aiding works. That's always true. When an adventurer is facing a challenge, somebody can give up their action to lend them a hand and try to grant them an advantage. Um, the fortune master decides if they can. Uh, sometimes the fortune master determines that you need the help of two or more advantages, adventurers just to gain an advantage. So no matter how many people help you, you just gain one advantage. But sometimes it might take a several people um, to help you. But if enough people help you might not say it's not even a challenge anymore you know four of you are going to lift this we don't even need to roll it's just not a challenge so it automatically succeeds all right so critical is three of a kind interesting you get a success for each set of two or more that land on the same side the number is unimportant a pair of twos is the same as a pair of threes and a pair and three ones have the same value as three sixes. Interesting. So to get a critical, which is the baseline, you need three of a kind. Interesting. So you need three ones, three fours, whatever. Huh. Interesting. Uh, I guess that's easy to sort of determine, right? Maybe. I mean, maybe that makes grouping them up easily. I don't know if they use this anywhere else, but um, uh, what are the odds for that? Do they have an odds table here? Look at that. They do. <laughs> oh, look at this. Great adventuring. Never tell me the odds. I love this. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I was going to say, if you only have three dice, the baseline success chance is very low. I was going to say, like, there's only six ways to do that. And there's six times six times six ways to do it so there's 216 so six divided by 216 is yep zero yeah very low um okay but we can see here how the percentages work out the impossible never really look good but remember you can have up to nine dice possible if you have like all the things that are stacked so that's uh still um Yeah, I mean, I would say that anything that is extreme or impossible in this game is going to result in failures a lot of time. But remember, the game always moves forward. It just means because it's the failure is very much a fail forward game. So 
Um, it's very interesting. Okay, what a hero. There's a couple of rules here. Uh, on the off chance that an adventurer rolls six of a kind, six dice landing on the same vice, the normal way to calculate successes is thrown out the window. The adventurer becomes the absolute protagonist of the scene, solving the situation however they wish. No matter how many traps or enemies they might be facing, everything goes better than expected. Okay, so this is like the super critical hit. If you roll six of a kind, you just, you just, you, you completely dominate the scene. Um, for every two matching dice, you get a basic success. For every three matching dice, you get a critical success. Oh, okay. So they do use poker hands here. Um, if you roll a full house, you get one basic success and one critical success. If you roll a straight, <laughs> you just get a wonderful failure. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, so more often than not, you will want to take a risk and re-roll your dice. Oh, okay. So there's, okay. Because I was about to say, like, these percentages seem really low. But it says here that you can take a risk and re-roll your dice to greatly increase your chances of success. So I'm getting very strong Yahtzee vibes from this resolution mechanic. Uh, where, you know, in Yahtzee, you get three attempts to try to make your, your hand. Um, oh, boy, look at, I love, I, mm, look at these narrative mechanics. The dice are always right. You don't always need to roll the dice, but any times you do, they are always right. If you're searching for a weapon and you roll an extreme success, you find one. It doesn't matter where you are. For this reason, it's important to decide whether you need to roll for an action or not. This is such. This is great advice for anybody playing Powered by the Apocalypse. Remember, if a move triggers in Powered by the Apocalypse, something is going to happen. Whether you get a six minus or a 10 plus, the game is going to change and you can't stop that. And the dice demand and you, what is going to happen. You can't back out of it after the, the the die is cast. So you need to think very heavily about like, hey, is this triggering a move? And if it is, we need to be prepared to live with those consequences. And the players need to know that, you know, players should never be forced into making a move, uh, you know, it, 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 to do an action, to do it, to do it. If, if you want to do that action, it's going to involve rolling dice. But you could always say, OK, well, I'm not going to take that action then. And that's that's totally fair. But. Um, and they're basically rule here. If you roll a success higher than what you need, you get more success than what you were expecting to do. If you're trying to hit a target and you need a basic challenge and you get a basic success, you make the shot. But if you get a critical success, you might take the enemy down in a single hit. If you roll a success lower than what you did, you still failed the challenge, but you might decide together with the fortune master that you to use your successes to do some damage control. So there's an idea of here of partial success. Um, interesting. Okay. If you get more than one success, you can do multiple actions. So if I get two sets of successes, I might be able to hit twice or hit once and then roll behind cover. Interesting. Um, so here's the probability theory. We got all that. Here's some uh, here's some examples. We'll skip that. All right, so this is what I really want to get into here. So there's a there's definitely an element here, like in Forbidden Lands, of pushing your luck, and your character is this big damn hero, and they are designed to sort of succeed no matter what, and the odds are going to keep pushing them forward. And the dice roll mechanic seems to really be pushing that because. The odds aren't so great unless you're really, really proficient. Um, and I remember expertise can also let you reroll dice, but it does seem like you would fail a lot, which is where these risks come in. If you roll the dice and you get the successes that you needed, you pass the chest, congratulations. But if you didn't, there's still a couple of things that you can do to save yourself from failure. And I think that this is another thing that is really important. I really like this in the Forbidden Land system. Um, D20 sometimes feels so, uh, final, you know, you make your roll and that's it. It's over. At, you know, at least Pathfinder 2 hero points let you re-roll. Shadram, take care. Thanks for stopping by tonight. But I love the idea of being able to say, 
no, I want to press my luck. I am willing to put my life on the line to get a success here. So if you roll at least one success of any kind, but you're not happy with it, you can present, press on and take a risk. Keep in mind that taking a risk greatly increases your chance of success. So it's recommended that you risk most of your rolls. So it's basically saying, yes, you should be taking a risk. When you do this, Again, that's very much the theme of the game. When you do this, you take all the dice that weren't part of a success and re-roll them. Bear in mind, you can't choose which dice to keep and which to roll. You have to keep all the dice you rolled in some kind of combination and re-roll the rest. If you get at least one additional success, you improve your situation. Okay, so why wouldn't I do that? Uh, there are cases where you can take a risk, but risk nothing at all. When you get the chance, you better take it. So you have nothing to lose, nothing to gain. When you're re-rolling a task related to one of your expertise, you okay, when you're expert, you can just re-roll for free. Um, so, okay. After you took a risk or if re you re rerolled for your expertise, you might still be dissatisfied. If you took a risk or re-rolling and you gained at least one additional success, you might feel lucky enough to try in and go all or nothing. This doesn't surprise me because, like I said, this feels very much like Yahtzee, and in Yahtzee, you get to go three times. Um, and so this is the third time, just like in Yahtzee by going all or nothing. You can re-roll all dice that are not part of any success one last time. And if you gain one, at least one additional success, well, you're still in luck. Otherwise you lose all of the successes that you've previously rolled, which is why it's called all or nothing. So this is a very, very high tension. Keep pushing it. I'm going to keep pushing it all or nothing. I just need a little bit more su success. Oh my God, I failed. The whole thing collapses and falls apart. Um, uh, cardboard tomato. If you've taken a risk and rolled no additional successes, you have to forfeit one of the successes you have previously rolled. The consequences of failing the risk. I think it got skipped. Oh, okay. Um... Oh, I guess it explains here. For example, if you roll a task with four dice and you get a one, three, three, six, you might want to risk it. To do so, you keep the two threes and re-roll the other two dice. If at this point you roll another pair or at least an additional three, you're in luck. If instead you've taken a risk and rolled no additional successes, you have to forfeit one of the successes you had previously rolled. Okay, there you go. So you do, you do sort of risk it. Got it. Okay. So, you know, it's a push your luck mechanic and it, it's like Yahtzee. They're obviously trying to use the Yahtzee mechanic to kind of create tension. Uh, I think it's clever. I think it's cute. I think it's easy for people to use. I think people understand straights and pairs and stuff for the most part. Um, I want to see where we want to get to tonight. I want to get through face the challenge. Um, okay. Let's get through this. So what happens if after all that you fail? Because this is this is kind of a big deal for these games. Um, if you didn't get the required success or any successes after rolling, re-rolling, and even risking, it means you failed. Uh, after failing, don't lose heart. It happens to the best adventurers. Um, blah, 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 making you feel better. Everything's great. <laughs> uh, you suffer an accident each challenge is a crossroad you can pass it and take the sunny road that takes you strolling directly towards your goal surrounded by bunnies and daisies or you can fail and end up on the long dark winding road surrounded by the stairs of ravenous beasts the results don't matter but you can't just stay still and stare at the crossroad whatever happened next keeps the story moving so again fail forward fail forward fail forward when you face a challenge, you need to ask yourself what can go wrong and decide the skill put to the test depending on your answer. Once you've got that down, it's easy to see what accidents might happen. Um, so, you know, these are the consequences. This is very, you know, blades in the darkish. Um, what are the consequences? If you're, you know, making observation task and fail, when you notice the pressure plate, you hear the clank of the tile beneath your feet. 
The accident in this situation could be that you triggered the trap and now have to face the danger, or maybe you can't lift your foot from that tile until you find a way to lock it in place. Uh, perhaps you're trying to seduce the spouse of your host at a party and get some information out of them. You roll charm test and fail. It doesn't mean that your advances are unwelcome, but rest assured there will be consequences. An accident in this situation could mean that you've made such a good impression that the host is now jealous and proceeds to pull you away into another room with a bunch of guys with guns and make jokes that you don't understand. So again, it's this idea of failing forward. Um, on some occasions, they might decide that a failure doesn't result in any accident, at least not now. They can sort of hold it back. No fail. In Broken Compass, failure is not an option. Uh, gee, it's almost like we made a video <laughs> uh, where people said, oh, my God, I can't believe you would play. A, what is even playing a game where you can't fail? Um, failure is not an option. This might seem weird, but it's not just a slogan. It's a rule, maybe even the most important rule of the book. At times, it might be hard for the fortune master to respect this. You need some trained improvisation muscles and a limber, flexible mind to find ways to transform each failure into success with accidents. If, as a fortune master, you find you're struggling, try asking your adventurers for ideas. Together, you can find ways to transform any failure into an advice that keeps things going. Uh, Frostjack says, this game seems very Derek in terms of philosophy. Well, remember, Derek in terms of philosophy is more about what is the theme or the tone of the game that we are going for? The problem, this game is about heroic adventure. The problem is a lot of the games that we play are about heroic adventure, aren't they? Isn't D&D &D and Pathfinder, aren't those supposed to be games of heroic adventure? I thought so. Like that is what those games seemed like they were meant to be about. And so that's why sometimes, you know, it, 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 the rules of those games can seem very counter purpose to me uh, when you know, in a game like this, it's like, look, succeed or fail. This this is about your character moving forward in the adventure, moving towards a conclusion. Um, and, and that's the way so many people talk about or seem to want to play their Pathfinder 2 or their 5e games. They want to see the adventure play out. They want to see the characters face the, the final villain. And they want to see the characters, you know, rise to the challenge and meet them. But then they're playing in a game system that basically treats failure as a dead end. Or, you know, even to the point of death. And it seems a little counterpurposed sometimes to me. Now, if I was playing an old school game mentality of D&D &D, where it's like, you're a bunch of treasure hunters, you're nobodies, you're not adventurers, you're, you know, mer mercenaries and brigands and, and scoundrels, um, then, you know, that's a different feel. And, you know, your character's life being cheap and being thrown away feels more in line with that. And eh, sometimes you fail tough, tough, tough luck, uh, you know, get good, son. But this game is obviously embracing that idea. So, I mean, that is this. This is very much a, you know, play by, Powered by the Apocalypse um, style where, you know, in Powered by the Apocalypse, if you roll a six minus, the GM may make as hard of a move as they would like. It is totally reasonable in Power of the Apocalypse to say that even if someone rolls a six or less, they succeeded, but maybe you present them with a really tough choice, or maybe they succeed and something bad happens regardless. Um, the idea being that your characters are still being these awesome heroes, but that they're not necessarily getting what they want. The situation is evolving in a way that they are not happy about. Um, so this is lastly about how you feel. Remember, these count as ad advantages or disadvantages, um, which add a dice or subtract a dice. Uh, the general rule is that adventurers can experience up to three feelings at a time. The only exception is when you feel like a wreck. <laughs> uh, the most common feelings are already listed on your sheet and are tied to the six fields giving you an advantage in that field. So if you're feeling particularly powerful, you'll get to roll an extra die whenever you take an action or guts skill. And then these are the disadvantages. Um, so it looks like these are just rewards for playing the game. 
Whenever you do something particularly exciting or get exceptionally good results, the fortune master may reward you with a good feeling. You can have up to three good feelings at a time. Um, you know, if you jump, jump your car across the side of the ravine and land in one piece, you might suddenly feel daring. And if you manage to fight a bear off with your bare hands, it goes without saying that you're feeling fierce. So this is just a fun way to mechanically represent your character's situational, their emotional state mechanically. I think, I think things like this are immensely powerful role-playing tools. I think they help people incredibly um, with, with, understanding not just how their character is going to play different mechanically but how their character is you know going to be maybe influence the way that they role play the character the choices the decisions the fluffy bullshit that they do is going to be influenced by their character feeling daring or fierce or confident i love it uh similarly anytime something bad happens or you fail miserably um, or uh, uh, of an important challenge or an extremely lethal danger, the GM might burden you, the fortune master, might burden you with a bad feeling. So again, these are just great ways to give people sort of conditions, positive and negative, as a reward for good playing, as a reward for uh, um, uh, failed die rolls, or just because the fiction sort of demands it. Um, I, I think that, the, you know, this idea that the fortune master, we all agree that regardless of what happened in the dice rolls or whatever, in our fictional game, my character is feeling embarrassed. And so my character should get this ability and status. And it's going to have a difference in the game. It's going to affect mechanics of it. And I think that is brilliant. Um, if you already have three bad feelings and you receive a fourth, you become a wreck. And now you have disadvantage in any task. Um, so... Once you're a wreck, you can no longer receive any bad feelings. To stop feeling a wreck, the only thing you can do is find yourself a safe place. So, again, this is sort of a way to sort of represent, you know, if you have, this is, you know, kind of a death spiral mechanic. But it is a way of saying, like, look, if your character is having a really, really bad run of things, maybe it is time for your character to retreat and regroup because they need that break because their character is pretty much tapped out. Um, and again, I think this, yep, this is exactly what I was just talking about. When do you assign a feeling when all the players go woo and cheer, that's when you grant a good feeling. And I love it. I love it. And look at this acting how you feel. Um, adventurers are tough folks who've been to hell and back. They rarely, if ever show how they feel, you might be shocked and just joke about it with a defiant grin on your face. You might feel daring uh, and still act cool and collected. Even if you're broken, you can say that it's just a scratch. You don't necessarily need to act the way you feel unless you think it's relevant. The same can't be the same can't be said about disadvantages. They're still there, and you can't act your way out of them. So, you know, I, I like this idea that like it's not forcing your character. It's not like saying you have to role play this way or you're going to lose the ability. It's still totally fine for your character to, you know, play the way you want to play them. Uh, this isn't forcing you to role play, but it is a really good, you know, suggestion and tool. Um, I love it. Uh, we can lose feelings. We can have first aid um, and then traps and bullets. So this is how we face dangers. So dangers are what can kill us. So we've got about. 15 minutes left, so I'm going to try to get through this chapter as quickly as possible. Hopefully, we won't miss anything, but I really want to understand how these luck points work. So, dangers are up, you know, things that could actually hurt you. Um, and when we face a danger, we know the difficulty, we know the stakes, um, and we, we still choose a skill just like before. Um, and again, you face dangers the same way you face challenges. You just follow the same list of instructions. The main difference between a danger and a challenge is that all dangers have the same goal. Get out alive. All right. So you know what's at stake. Essentially, when you're facing a danger, you're either at risk of getting hurt or worse or losing something that is crucially important, a weapon, an artifact, or even the treasure itself. All right. So this is really upping the upping the the score we got some rules here for a bunch of different dangers at a time same things that we saw on challenges before um so let's say you fail the danger roll 
let's get one thing straight. You wouldn't be alive if it weren't for luck's good side. When a normal person faces danger, there are two options. They either step up or they face the bitter end. So if you're in a dangerous situation and you're a normal person, you either succeed or you fail and that's it. You're an adventurer, however, and you can rely on good luck to get you through situations. Every time you fail a task while facing a danger with serious harm or life at the stake, this is where your luck comes out. And, and as we expected, luck is a form is their form of hit points, right? So you have 10 luck points. And whenever you fail in the face of a danger, you lose a number of luck points tied to the difficulty and come out unscathed. So if you're facing a critical danger and you fail it, you lose three luck points. Long story short, as long as you have luck points, you can't really fail and you always manage to somehow get out in one piece. This is a meta currency, a meta plot protection. This is saying, now granted, it's ablative. You can still lose it all and then you're out of luck and then things are going crazy. But that's a choice that your character, you know, that you as a player are choosing to make. But your character is never just going to, uh, you know, even if you fail an impossible danger, if you have a luck coin, you'll be out, of, you'll lose all your luck and your luck coin and you'll still be around. So um, this is a fantastic way of sort of reflecting that. And, and the game is trying to make light of this. It's not trying to say, oh, your character has a lot of hit points. They can take a lot of damage or whatever. It's saying, nope, it, it's lucky. Like your character falls off the cliff, but, but lands into, you know, the, the, the pillow truck. Um, and, you know, if that seems kind of silly and campy and weird, watch these movies sometimes. A lot of times the character escapes because they got lucky because fortune is on their side, because fortune favors the bold. It's all about genre emulation, and that is what this is trying to do. Um, so I like that. Um, for example, if you take a leap off a cliff and try to grab a vine in order not to end up mushed on the ground, failing does not mean that you bite the dust. If you have enough luck points, you spend them to change the failure into success. Maybe you don't grab the vine you were aiming for, but while falling, you end up caught up in another one. Pure, blind luck. There's also something very powerful and empowering. Uh, resistance roles in Blades in the Dark work the same way. When the GM tells you as a player, this is the bad thing that's happening to your character. You failed the role. This bad thing is now going to happen to you. This bad consequence is going to happen to you. If you as a player have a resource, which in Blades in the Dark is your stress through resistance rolls, and in Broken Compass, it's your luck points. When you as the player feel like I have the ability to sort of step up and say, not today, you know, I'm I I have I have this ability to sort of deny fate. I have this ability to sort of override at my discretion. Um, and it's gonna it might cost me and it it, it I can't do it forever. But right now, today, I can say no. That is a very empowering thing. And I, I think that's very, and I, I know that it's difficult to impress upon you, but having played these games, not this game, but having played games like it, there is a very, very important psychological and fundamental shift that happens when the players feel like they have this bank of reliability that they can rely on to deal with the inequities of life. You know, I've often talked about how before that the hero point mechanic in Pathfinder 2 is horribly named because failing in Pathfinder 2 is disappointing. But spending a hero point to re-roll a failed roll only to fail or even roll worse actually ends up making you feel worse than you did before you do you not i mean failing made you probably not really feel that great you probably didn't really feel like a hero but a lot of times spending a hero point will actually make you feel like less of a hero you'll actually feel like more of a failure and that is a very weird mechanic to put into the game and it's very weird to call it a hero point especially for a game that seems to be about fantasy action adventure and they call them heroes in the, in the book. And that's kind of one of those things that I'm trying to point out here. Um, Frostjack says, I love how thematic all the rules are. 
Uh, you can really, you can't really read this without getting a really good feel for the fantasy and the fiction. Exactly, the rules are helping me understand the fantasy and the fiction. So we know what this game is about. All right, the game is clearly about action adventure pulp fantasy, you know, pulp uh, action adventure movies with larger than life heroes who are going way in over their trouble, you know, way, way in over their head. They are pulling out amazing and incredible successes. They're hyper competent. They're skilled. They're always pushing their luck. And it always seems to come out, uh, you know, on, in their favor, no matter how hairy the situation gets. And the game's mechanics really do seem to support that. And I also would point out that the game like this should feel quick rolling, right? These movies are usually very tightly edited and they're very aggressively paced, right? We just, we boom, we boom, we boom. We go from one scene to another scene to another scene. Yeah, we have some, you know, light moments where there might be a little bit of character building and development. But for the most point, you know, it's like action scene. You know, there's a, a quiet scene, action scene, another quiet scene. You know, if you watch an Indiana Jones movie, they go from, you know, the, the, you know, quietly searching in the library to boom, it's a boat chase through the canals of Venice. And then it's, you know, and then it's uh, back to uh, a uh, kind of a, of a quiet scene. And then boom, we're captured by Nazis. And now we're breaking out of a Nazi castle, right? Like everything is always sort of boom, 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 paced, you know, very aggressively. And I think the game, the movies like that, but the game seems to support that as well, because you're, you're just constantly pushing and pushing and going forward. So I really do think that's amazing. Um, cardboard says, uh, yeah, it's luck and pushing your luck all the way down from the Yahtzee mechanics to the HP. And we haven't even gotten to the luck coin yet. Yeah. So we're about to get to the luck coin, I think. Um, so, uh, what happens if we're out of luck? Well, should you ever lose all of your luck points? or more luck points than you have remaining, simply fill in all the dots, and from now on out, we are out of luck. The good news is that so long as you have one luck point remaining, you can still survive one danger of any kind. For example, if you fail while facing three critical dangers, you are nine luck points light, short. If you have less than nine, you simply fill them all out and out of luck. So basically, this is another nice thing, you're not gonna get caught with your pants down. You will know uh, you know, if you only have one or two luck points left and you suffer, you need eight luck points, you're still good. You just, you know, it's like, it's like Pathfinder two. You don't go negative, right? You just go to zero. But then once you're at zero, you're at out of luck. Now, now your butt is on the line and now you have to make some important decisions. Being out of luck means you can no longer rely on luck to save your life. If you fail again while facing danger, then you're really truly putting your life on the line. The only way to escape certain death is to use a luck coin. If you can't overcome a danger, you can always try to do some damage control. For damage control, you can use successes you rolled to avoid losing part of your luck, even though you can't complete the task you rolled. Okay, so if we failed, but we can use our successes that weren't enough to succeed, but we can use them to sort of mitigate how much luck we lost. So that's pretty cool. So it's like a, you know, it's a consolation prize. <laughs> Call it luck. Call it fate, call it karma, um, call it stats, call it karma, call it magic, call it fate. No idea how or why, but at some point, luck turns her back on you and you're left on your own. The only way to recover your luck is to get yourself out of troubles you put yourself in. Thank goodness, luck points are fully recovered when you're out of danger and can breathe a sigh of relief. At the end of a sequence, we just talked about sequences, the boat chase through Venice, the, the, the escaping the Nazi castle in... Um, Indiana Jones, Last Crusade. At the end of a sequence, for example, after getting out of a temple filled with traps and pitfalls, the fortune master might declare that the adventurers can take a break and recover all their luck. After all, adventurers deserve to take a break after surviving many dangers when they can actually let their guard down and relax without risking their life for a second. Uh, in some cases, you might allow adventurers to take a break after searing, facing a series of dangers, but before another batch comes in. Um, you know, this is that classic moment where you know the party's in the middle of a of, an, of a crazy action sequence, and then now they like they they're trapped. The doors are barricaded, but the monsters are starting to break in, and they have that you know that you know you can imagine in the movie. It's a, it's a break in the tension. There's that brief moment where you know the one character turns to the other one and says, "You know, I never thought I'd die fighting beside an elf. Uh, how about fighting beside a good friend? 
I, I could do that. That is like a, a scene of them regaining all their luck, right? Like it's that it's a brief vignette, a moment. And it's a great way mechanically to tell your players, hey, here's a moment to focus in and have a quiet moment to to refill, you know, to renew yourself, to feel empowered by who you are and what you are and who you're with, your companions, what you're here for, your drive, your grit, your determination, your skill, and boom, you're back into it. And you just off to the races. This is not a game about managing, you know, intense resource depletions. Um, safe places are houses, hotels, or even camps where you can fully rest and recover and recover your luck points. So we you know, will also have those, but we're probably not going to get to that today. So here, this is the last thing I want to get to. We've been talking about these luck coins, the whole thing. Um, your luck coin is your best friend, your ace in the hole, your lifeline all wrapped in one. If you're out of luck and you fail a damage roll, sorry, if you fail a danger roll, you just need to use a luck coin to save your skin. To use your luck coin, you just tell your fortune master. That's about it. <laughs> After using a luck coin, you need to flip a coin to find out if your luck coin remains with you or if it's used up and goes to the fortune master. So it's literally a coin. Tails, you lucky dog. You took a chance and you made it. Not only did you manage to dodge a danger thanks to your luck coin, you also get to keep it. Heads, let's look at the bright side. Your luck coin did its job anyways. You now have to wave it goodbye and pass it to the fortune master. So this is it. I mean, this game is really trying hard to make sure that your character cannot die. You have all your luck. Then, only when your luck is all completely you know, drained out, then you still might die. You have a luck coin. Flip it. If you have a luck coin, you're not going to die, period. And if you get a tails, you still get to keep it. It's only if you don't have a luck coin that you're in trouble. And even if you use it, you, you're, you're saved. But if you roll heads, you do lose it. But it's still going to save you from that time, you know. So this is really making sure that the player, you know, they're, they're very slowly raising up their death flag. They're, the player is almost saying, I'm okay taking these risks going forward. I understand that without a luck coin and no luck that I am putting myself into this danger willingly. They're never going to get caught with their pants down. So there's a lot of player agency to these decisions. You're never going to get surprised killed. And that I think is really, really important. Um, and right. And I, I, I frost Jack, that's a great point too. Now, it's not boring because there's plenty of consequences leading up to your death. Your character is going to get bad feelings. You know, the treasure might be getting away. Um, you know, you might be causing issues with the U.S. consulate. You might be pissing off the 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 French, uh, you know, Interpol or whatever, you know, the French agents um, who, you know, are mad that you're running through their country, that you're going to cause all sorts of fallout and headache and problems and your passport gets revoked and, you know, you lose your job at the, you know, at the university and your wife leaves you. Oh, for your rival, you know, like things are still happening to your character, but you're still in it. You're still going. And I think that's what's so interesting and fun about these games. Um, all right. So you can use your luck coin for a bunch of stuff. You can save yourself from certain death. You can achieve an extreme success without even rolling the dice. How's that for a Derek hero point? You can remove a bad feeling. You can keep hold of an item that you would otherwise lose. You could save a vehicle that would otherwise be destroyed. You can get a clue that you missed. If you use your luck coin to escape certain deaths, some serendipitous accident or one of your friends intervenes to save you by the skin of your teeth. If you set off a trap, a blade comes swinging towards you at full speed. All you have lost, all hope of survival. You can use a luck coin, and if you do, maybe the blade just happens to stop one inch in front of your nose. Clearly, few things are better than managing to get home on your own two feet. But the other uses of luck coins are almost as good. If you find yourself facing a challenge that's too great, you could choose not to roll any of the dice, use your luck coin, and get the benefits of an extreme success. That is a way, that is a player saying, I win. I am willing to give up this avoid certain death coin because I think that this is something that my character would succeed at. And I want to make this, I want to make this a stand. And of course it's just the risk that you're going to lose it. Um, while filling in your adventure sheet and setting out in a journey, 
you start with luck, one luck coin, the same as your friends. At the same time, the fortune master has one luck coin for each adventurer. In total, we could say that in every series, there are always twice as many luck coins as there are adventurers. As the adventurers progress, every time they use their luck coins, they flip the coin. And if it lands on tails, the luck coin goes to the fortune master. The fortune master has no use for luck coins, but they can choose to give them to adventurers as a reward for their achievements, good ideas, strokes of luck, and in any other occasion where they feel the need to mark the importance of their actions or Oscar worthy role play. So, I mean, this is superhero, mutants and masterminds, fate, savage worlds, 101. You are playing awesome. You're making the game fun. That was an incredible sequence of events. What a die roll. What a great joke. What a funny zinger or one liner. What an awesome character moment. Here is a luck coin. Once the fortune master has no luck coins, they can't give any more to the adventurers until they use or lose one, putting it back into the pool. Having a luck coin is a safety net, but do not rely on your rabbit foot for too long. The rabbit had four and look what that brought it. Luck coins belong to you and they can't be given to anyone for any reason. However, if an adventurer is facing certain death and has no luck coins to save themselves, you can decide to use your luck coin to help a friend last minute. By doing so, you sacrifice your luck coin and give it directly to the fortune master. No flipping, no possibility of keeping it, respect. Again, what a beautiful mechanic because we just said how powerful these luck coins are. And if you save your friend, you get to be the big damn hero and you get to succeed automatically, but you are giving it, but you're not getting that for free. You automatically lose that amazing and incredible luck coin. And that's a, that's a powerful mechanical moment. Lastly, when to give a luck coin coming all the way full circle, the words and adventurers live by aren't just a fancy saying on their sheet. Remember these from all the way back in the beginning of the game on our character sheet? We write in our words to live by. They even gave us uh, in the random adventure creator, they gave us some uh, 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 random choices to uh, to, to create it. Um, let's see, where, where were they? Oh, there we go. Maybe um, no one gets left behind. Your death, my life. Knowledge is power. Trust me, I read it some. I read it somewhere. So we have these words to live by that were written on our character sheet. Well, turns out they do have a game point or game purpose, which is here we go. They're not just fancy saying on your sheet. Uh, these are the words that you've built your life around. When you act in accordance with your words to live by, even if it goes against your personal gain. When it makes you, you face hard choices or live like a true hero, these are the perfect moments for the fortune master to give you a luck coin. So what a great moment. Broadly speaking, the fortune master should give away luck coins to reward fair play or meaningful actions. When, for example, an adventurer accomplishes something amazing, they turn the whole episode, maybe the whole season around in an incredible sequence or moments of events. And we've all played role-playing games where there have just been these incredible, amazing, unbelievable moments. You had to be there and they just, they just light the session on fire. You could just see the energy. Like I love being able to reward people with these kind of big damn rewards um a good rule of thumb for fortune master is follow their heart rather than their head love it for rewarding these hero points if it feels right to do so if this just feels like it's what should be done go for it let instincts guide you Finally, when adventurers succeed against all odds and play their hands admirably, maybe by rolling an extreme success. So sometimes, you know what? Just respect respect the odds. If somebody does something completely stupid and silly and they just get lucky as all hell, what better time to say, you know what? You, that deserves a luck coin. Your character has it. Um, the rule above all other rules is that when an adventurer uses their luck coin to carry out a task, however and crucial and wonderful it may be, they cannot gain another luck coin for it. That's just not how it goes. Awesome. I mean, that is an incredible sequence of events. And obviously the game goes into, you know, how to deal with traps and enemies and fighting hand to hand, shooting out your guns. Um, and so obviously there's more, you know, there's there's some combat rules here. There's some complexity to some of these um, other elements of the game. So, you know, it's, it's not super duper completely lightweight. Um, but it does seem like it's a very fast and free willing game. They've got some great uh, examples of play here. 
the PDF is having a heart attack, apparently, trying to load this. Um, so some information about dangers and enemies, uh, just giving you lots of this. And of course, even coming, how dealing with character death and how a character might die. And then a whole section about the treasures, which we didn't get a chance to get to. But, um, you know, I think for two hours, I think we really covered, I think, you know, the, the, the meat and potatoes of this, of this system. Um, so I know there's not a lot of you in here today, but, uh, you know, we'll make a poll here. Um, so what do you think, uh, about broken compass? Um, is it, uh, is it something that you would be, you know, uh, interested in and or is it something that uh you know is definitely not something that you would ever want to play um and i think uh I'm, I'm interested again we i know we don't have a lot of people in here but you know i i i i love the potential for this game to be a quick pick up and play although i think playing a, a, a you know i don't think i'd want to play this for like the length of a time of like a paizo ap um but i think Playing this for like four to six sessions, maybe that's your season, four to six sessions. Uh, I think that could be a lot of fun. Uh, that's enough time, I think, to really see your character grow and develop. And remember, you know, we talked about rewarding. Obviously, there's the things like the good feelings. There's the luck coin. And we didn't get to scars and experience, but I'm assuming that, you know, that is a, a really cool method for, you know, advancing your character. But oh, because, because overall, you know, this isn't a D20 game. You're not gaining 20 levels. You're not gaining 40 feats. You can see that your character starts off fairly robust from the beginning. Um, so it does a lot of things that I, I think I like for the games to do. Um, it's, it's pretty rules light. Again, we didn't get into the brawl or the guns section. Uh, you know, it, it's probably light enough that for me that I wouldn't want to play this for more than, you know, like I said, like a, a four to six episode season. But I think that could be a lot of fun. And, you know, setting up sort of an of an arc, um, uh, each episode is sort of a standalone thing. And, you know, the characters face ever escalating goals. And then you get to this really cool finale, which is just what the adventure says. And then you have this really cool moment and, you know, whatever happens, come what may. Um, I, think that's a, I think that's a really a cool idea. What I will say, is that the random GM advice that is thrown and dispersed throughout this book is top notch. Uh, it's it's everything that I want people to be doing in a game. This particular system happens to give you the tools that you need in order to be able to do it. Now, is this going to fulfill your need for grid based tactical miniature combat? No. Does it have that sort of built in power fantasy, you know, the idea of zero to hero and this sort of ever escalating skill. No, I mean, even blades in the dark has a lot more experience point tracking and you gain new abilities and you're improving your skills. And I mean, there's clearly a, a, uh, a reward cycle and progression there in the game. We saw that on the character sheet, but it is a very simplistic system. This is not a game about building characters. It's not about your PC. It's about the adventure. It's about the story that you're telling collaboratively. It's very important to understand that distinction. Some games are about the character specifically. This is more about what is going on. Your, your character is just getting caught up in the adventure. Like think about Indiana Jones. What do we really know about Indiana Jones? What do we, what do we even really care about Indiana Jones, right? Indiana Jones is just a vessel for us to go on these incredible adventures. And sure, we have these fun moments where we learn a little bit about his, his past and his history, but for the most part, we really, Indiana Jones doesn't really grow or develop and we don't really see that in his character. His character is there as a medium to allow us, you know, he he's the boat that we take to go on this, this journey of adventure. Uh, and I think that's very true of this game as well. This is not about, um, you know, this is not about investing into a character and really watching them grow and develop. The, the game even basically said, don't write a backstory. It's not about that. It's not that kind of game. And I respect that for you know coming out and saying that. But a lot of the stuff it said earlier in the book about 
sharing you know narrative authority with your players asking them for advice and information and and um you know all those those elements about you know uh if, if you're going to roll the dice then by god abide by those results i mean those are just philosophies that i just i just love and adore and i think they just create for the most more much 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 more interesting type of advance uh, or type of game that i would love to play um all right, let's see what our poll is. 44% say sounds great. 56% see said seems fun. So overall, I think that's I think that's a pretty good result from a poll. Um I think that, you know, people I think people respect it. I think people like it. Um Frostjack says this might just end up on my shelf. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a printing issue. Obviously, I bought the PDF. Not not a cheap PDF. It's like twenty twenty two dollars. Um, I think it's a very small company, but it was published by Simon. But I mean, the company itself that actually made it pretty small. I don't know what's going on with um, the printing of the books. I know it was a Kickstarter. The copyright date was twenty twenty two. So, um, Cardboard says uh, all the rest of the rules are basically gravy. The kind of stuff you can rule at the table instead of digging back into the books, or if you don't remember. Well, that's the other thing. This game really strikes me as a type that it's very easy for a game master to be able to just roll with the punches, you know? Oh, you failed to die roll. Uh, you know, you, you feel confused and she's getting away. Okay. You know, and the adventure continues. It's like, Oh, chaser, get after her. You know, like you don't really have to sweat so many of the details because it's just not that kind of game. And because of this luck die mechanic and the, well, the luck mechanic period, but specifically because of the luck dice mechanic, you can feel free as a game master to really throw anything at the party, you know, to quote Indiana Jones, even if it is a little stupid from kingdom of the crystal skull, you could literally drop an atomic bomb on your party. And if they have a luck coin, they're going to survive. You know, um, they find a, they find a lead refrigerator. It gets ejected 17 miles. It lands in the middle of the New Mexico desert and you bump, you roll out with your hat. And uh, the and the Q theme music, um, so I think that you know that y it gives you kind of carte blanche as a game master to say this is going to get crazier. Yeah, the volcano's erupting. Yeah, the ancient serpent god that lives in the volcano is real, and it's coming up and it's trying to eat you because you your characters have this incredible resource to just constantly be able to get out of these crazy moments. Um, and you know, and then when that does run out, or if it does run out. Uh, then your players, you know, they 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 understand that the, the the sequence of events that got them to this point. So, uh, let's see. Damien says, seems fun. Uh, seems like uh, it does some things that other games I like do. That seems reasonable. Um, yeah, I think it would be good for expanding TTRPG. It's a, it's a different style of playing. It's a different style of GMing. And I think that alone is really interesting. Um, it will allow them to sur survive the rebirth of the multiverse. Of course it would, Lollipop. Um, uh, Damien, that's ex that's expressly why I pointed it out, that, that that was the moment where people went, this is too much. As if, right, as if Indiana Jones didn't, you know, recover, survive from a million other things. Um, yeah, so, I mean, overall, I'm going to say that uh, I think this game's great i'm gonna definitely finish this pdf full read through um it's definitely gonna be something that i would really easily want to play as a pickup game uh at a convention or something like that and would i play it as a three to six episode series or limited season absolutely would i ever expect this game to be like my full time game no uh, i don't think it would be but um you know because i mean part of the fun for me in, in role-playing games is that idea of building the character. I mean, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't make my character builds to level 20 on path builder like some people do, but I do like this idea of my character, uh, the, the, the growth and the changes. Uh, and you know, maybe I'm underselling that maybe that part of the game is there and it is part of it, but the theme of the game really seems to be more about the adventure than the character. And I respect that. I respect that. It seems like they still have some elements in there with the, uh, experiences and scars section, but, Overall, I think it's really more about the fun experience of it. And that could be a lot of fun. And being able to take those kind of big risks um, 
it's just fantastic. And Frost Jack, I also agree with that. It's a great point. Is everyone's seen these movies, right? Everyone has seen or played these video games um, uh, or seen these movies. Everyone knows Indiana Jones and you know the Mummy and 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 movies like that. So I think that's really really fun way to just push that. Um, and, and push into that genre. So this is very good, strong genre emulation. And those type of movies are really great and fun. And again, I love, I think as a GM, having knowing that your players have that luck coin, it just allows you to do anything. Because if if the task is insane, remember, they can, they can use a luck coin to get an automatic exceptional success. So even if you put them in a situation that's like, well, how could you ever succeed at this? If they have a luck coin, they could... Say, I'm going to fl flip the coin. I might lose it, but heads or tails, I'm going to succeed at this. It's like, that's a powerful thing as a GM to feel that freedom to just say, I am just going to go where my imagination or my thoughts or my feelings, or maybe if you're Ben, you know, you're rolling on an Oracle, but you, you are just going to go with what the fiction says. And if the bridge you know and you just you, the words come out of your mouth you disconnect the part of your brain that goes uh, is that an appropriate level challenge how are they gonna get out of that am i making this unfair like the party's fighting on a, a rope bridge and they're fighting a bunch of you know scimitar wielding uh you know uh, 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 uh robed cultists and they cut the rope and you go, oh, you know, the river below is full of crocodiles. And you go, the bridge starts to un unravel. And like people are like, I rush for the edge. And you're like, you fail. The bridge collapses. You fall into the river. Like in, in D20, you'd be panicking because you'd be like, oh, my God, it's it's a 400 foot fall. They're going to take 200 damage. Plus there's a crocodile. They're just dead. But you don't have to worry about any of that at all because they have a luck coin and they're going to be fine. Hell, they're going to be fine, and there's like a 50% chance that they won't even lose the luck coin. So, you know, like you can just narrate and go with the fiction as you see fit. And if your players want to do something, just say sure, because it doesn't really matter, right? So you can just, boom, you can just go into that. Um, and Cardboard Tomato, that's exactly the point. It, it The player is making a choice because you know how powerful that coin is. And so when the coin isn't there, you understand that your character is making that choice. You, you the player, are making that choice willingly. Like you are stepping into the lion's mouth, fully aware that, you know, the safety, the train wheels are off, the safety harness is removed. And that can feel very powerful too. That can be very empowering as well. Um, because then when you die, if you die, but when you die, it almost feels like it was on your terms. You were okay. You were the one who made that call. You were out of luck points. You're out of your luck coin. Maybe you even used it to save another character, but you stay behind to hold off the giant scorpion monsters while the party flees the collapsing pyramid with the gem in hand. And you do that and you, you know, you're going to make checks. You're going to try to fight your way out, but you understand that fundamentally you did that fully accepting you and realizing your fate. And so even if you, if you succeed, in fact, number one, it's a win-win because if you succeed at that, everyone's going to be hooting and hollering. And the GM is probably just going to give you that fucking coin right back. And so you're going to be like the man or, you know, or the woman, you're going to be the, the, the victor of the day. And if you lose, but everybody else got away and you die, it felt like you did it on your terms and that was your call. And that could be very empowering too. Um, and I, I think that that style of play is really, really rewarding. Uh, when the players feel empowered, when the players feel like they have agency, when the players feel like they're in the driver's seat, that can be an incredibly powerful thing. I've seen it happen. My Most of my experience with this is with Blades in the Dark, with the way that resistance rolls work and the stress mechanic in blades in the dark, anything bad that happens to you, any consequence, even a, even a narrative consequence, um, maybe, you know, it's not just, Oh, you broke your leg or, Oh, you got stabbed in the heart, but it could also be like, Oh, you know, uh, you lose the confidence of this gang of thieves or, Oh, the blue coats, the, the police get, find out who, who you really are. Anytime there's a consequence, you can stay. No, 
I'm going to resist that. My character is not going to allow that to happen. And you get to roll the dice and it's, it's guaranteed success. The only question is how much stress are you going to pay for it? And that could be problematic for your character because it could you know, cause problems for your character as they become tra traumatized from having too much stress. But you get to have that authority in a game and having authority in a game is very empowering. Um, all right, let me go here, here. Um, Cardboard Tomato says, uh, not to jump too far ahead, but there's a section on regarding certain death. The funny thing about certain death is it's, <laughs> is, is that it's all but certain, <laughs> which feels very genre appropriate, popping up again when you least expecting it. Exactly, exactly, 100%. Um, I love it, you know? Uh, I'm sure they have rules in there too about if a character does die, but they didn't see the body, you never quite know whether they're dead or not. And that probably goes for rivals as well as for adventurers. Um, Damien, that's a great example where he jumps out of the, that's in Temple of Doom, right? He jumps, out, Indiana Jones jumps out of a crashing plane in a life raft and lands in uh, the river or uh, on the edge of a mountain or something like that. I don't even remember what it was, but that's somehow he survives that. That to me is 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 just as implausible as surviving in the, the refrigerator. Uh, Boothby just got back. Thumbs up or thumbs down on Broken Compass? I'm gonna give Broken Compass. Um, I'm gonna give it two thumbs up. I think it does a great job following Jared Sorensen's rules. I think the game is very solidly about something. It explains it in very clear language. It gives you the tools to create a game that I think is going to create that play experience. It's going to allow your character to fit the shoes of the genre emulation that you're trying to do. I do not know, now I can't, we didn't talk about scars or rewards, but I can say that the game through the luck mechanic and through the feelings mechanics feels like the game gives you a lot of ways for your character to feel rewarded. When your character jumps their motorcycle across the burning ravine and the GM says, I feel daring and gives you that, you know, you say, Mark, I feel daring or I feel like a badass. The player goes, yes, doing the cool things gives me advantages, which means I'm more likely to be able to do future cool things. And that's very rewarding. And you know, this luck coin mechanic is the ultimate press your luck mechanic, but giving the players that one ultimate get out of jail free card is I think very compelling. And it's an incredible resource to have as a player to be able to do that. So, um, so yeah, um, very, very cool. Um, you know, even with all the affordances they give you in this game, people still died, but they were all very memorable. I, I bet cardboard tomato. Well, great having you around cardboard tape tomato. Um, Frost Jack says certainly thumbs up as well for, for them. And Boothby says, I'll check it out tomorrow. So, uh, well, we went about half an hour over, but that's, that's okay. Um, I had fun, um, you know, reading through these games is, a. I love doing it. That's why I own so many RPG books. Um, PDFs are okay. I'd rather do it with a real book, of course, but you know, sharing this all with you. Um, and we'll continue to dig into it. Um, I don't have a link below. I know it's available on drive through RPG, but um, hey, thanks Frost Jack. Frost Jack tipped $3. Really enjoyed the first look format. I would love to see it return. Absolutely. I think, you know, uh, we have a couple ideas from, for games, maybe the Sentinels comics game, uh, maybe Traveler. Um, I think it's a fun format. I'd love to be able to get out of here and do this, you know, like I said, at least once a month. Uh, and, you know, just have a fun way to expose all of us to new role-playing games. It's important for me to be exposed to new games as well. Um, uh, I don't want to always just keep going back to the same old, you know, Powered by the Apocalypse, Blades in the Dark, Legend of Five Rings Standby. Like, I want to I want to learn new games too. So I'm right there with you. Um, so thank you again. If you enjoyed this conversation, if you enjoyed this topic, please let me know in the comments below what you thought about it. Um, if you thought the format was interesting, what I could do to maybe make this a better experience and better, uh, instructional. I mean, again, I'm literally reading these rules for the first time, but maybe there are some things that we could do better. If there are some games that are maybe somewhat new, let's say in the last year or so that maybe I haven't talked about. So there's a good chance I've never read them. Maybe offer them up as a suggestion. Maybe we'll, we'll get to it and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a quick look at it. If a game is really short like a micro RPG, that is definitely something that we can, uh, we can go over and cover. So, uh, you know, this is obviously a bigger, a little bit of a bigger book, but, uh, and ultimately also at the end of the day, I want to thank, say thank you to Ben for the amazing tip. Thank you to, uh, <clears throat> thank you to Frostjack for the, uh, for the tip as well. 
Thank you to everybody who supports us. Thank you to our nice last call patrons. And if you are interested in supporting this channel and joining conversations and getting more information from crazy people who play these games all the time, take a look at our Patreon, patreon.com slash patreon.com slash nights of last call. We have a link in the description below and, uh, and our main channel page. Uh, we got a couple different tiers. It's going to get you a lot of bonus content, access to different games, community games, Northern reaches, bonus content, battle cry magazine, but also our discord where all the fun and the magic happens. So thank you again, everybody. Uh, I am going to be out Thursday. I'm flying to Las Vegas. Um, and, uh, I'm going to be uh, on vacation for the weekend before the holidays, but I'm going to be back, uh, next week. And we're going to be wrapping up uh, quest for the frozen flame after our technical difficulties last week and getting ready for a pop it holiday adventure sometime there in that last week or two of December. And that's going to be a lot of fun too. So stay tuned and, uh, we'll see you next time on nights of last call. Peace.